What is up, everybody? Welcome to the 31 on 31 Monsters and Machines Debrief. Yes, we missed the last one, but I promise we're going to make for, make up for, for this one. So, for everybody that uh, is not familiar with everybody that you see right now, of course, you're on my channel. I'm Cody Leach. To my right is CP Charles from Willis Gredia. Below me, Brian Lomax. And over in the corner there, looking away, is youthful <laughs> Uncle Sean Chandler. <laughs> The links to everybody's channels are going to be in the video description. Please subscribe to their channels. And if you're not familiar with what 31 on 31 is, it is a video series we've been doing for a couple of years. Um, primarily is on Halloween, but we've been kind of branching off doing a couple more a year where we pick a theme, pick some movie franchises that fit said theme, and rank all 31 movies on the 31st of the month. And last month we did sci-fi films. So we did Terminator. Blade Runner, Alien, Predator, Total Recall, The Matrix, and uh, RoboCop. I don't believe I'm missing any. But uh, all of those ranking videos are up for you to watch, and this is where we talk about all of our individual scores, average them out, and we do basically a group video. And in the middle of all that, we get uh, friendly heated about all the difference of opinions, <laughs> of which there's a lot De this time. Debate. So, yeah, Debate. there you go. There you go. So, uh, going around the horn, CP. How are you? Hi, how are you? I'm doing well. I've been working all day on videos. So once we get done with this stream, I'm like turning the computer off for the next two days. Yeah, I just want to thank. Uh, I mean, I know this was long, long planned in the, in in advance, but uh, uh, my channel has been a bit rough with a bunch of personal stuff going on. I lost all my gear in the UK, but. Um, this really bounced the channel back, and I really appreciate having this project to to put it on. Absolutely. And we got another fun one coming in October that's going to be even crazier. <laughs> Gold. So, uh... <laughs> just, just, just print money. <laughs> oh, shut up, Brian. <laughs> Speaking of shut up, Brian. How are you, you watch <laughs> one new movie. <laughs> <laughs> How are the kids, Brian? Finally asleep. There we go. Yes. It's it's such an awkward time because obviously for you guys it's like I don't know what tea time nearly, and for me it's that sweet spot where your kids uh, might go sleep if you just about get them right. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so it just becomes a bit of a ball like. I told yeah, you, man. Mike, Will, and the Bourbon. Down. It would have taken five minutes. Like a mm -hmm. mallet, mallet. Yeah. Just... <laughs> or cage, <laughs> dead bolts fix all your problems. <laughs> Uncle Sean, how you doing? Terrible. Look at my resolution on this. It's a, <laughs> it's a nightmare. Yeah. Uh, anyway, yeah, I bought new. I got new internet equipment. Everything. I actually have a new camera and everything, but uh, that doesn't change the service being terrible. <laughs> <laughs> did internet tests before this and my upload speed was dramatically faster that or download speed was dramatically faster by a factor of like 40 than my upload speed so it is what it is um but been busy posted five videos already today so whew, keep yeah it busy. I've, I've been kind of checking twitter here and there and i, I put a tweet out I've, I've come to the realization that i'm at that point where i just don't care about anything that disney's putting out right now and it's really depressing like they're just churning out marvel and star wars and i'm just sitting here like hmm. well, I, maybe I one day i'll get back to it i clicked and then i saw that, that the little mermaid was getting that kind of attention and i was like no, no oh that's I, I, going on. I don't care yeah. I, I don't I don't I don't want no more of this. All right. So let me get these quick super chats really quick and then we will get rolling. Joe Gilbert requesting a Stephen King 31 on 31 <laughs> somehow. Uh, we might be able to incorporate him. I don't know about. I think he has way more than 31. He uh, does. Hello, Mr. Chandler, Cody and others. <laughs> Hi, others. How you find gentlemen? <laughs> We're all doing good. All right. Oh, God. Yeah. Stephen King. He uh he has this he's infamous he has a a one dollar you, you can you can get the rights to a lot of his material for a dollar if that you'd like to lot. make it into a film so awesome 
All right, guys. So, uh, first of all, gigantic thank you to Robert Alex, who was in the chat earlier. I don't know if he still is. Uh, mm -hmm. Oh, there he is, right there. Uh, usually, me and CP, one of us takes the burden of adding up all the scores, figuring out all the math, yeah. and doing all of that. But the past two debriefs, yeah. uh, Robert Alex has done the work for us and just sent it to us. So, That's thank clutch, you so much, Robert. sir. Um, yeah, right when me and CP were like, Ugh. Who's going to do it? And you know what? Somebody <laughs> somebody else had an... I, 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 forgive me. Somebody had a, another interesting stat below that, but the, the comment was deleted for some reason, where they had the biggest disparages between us like uh well, i already know what that is <laughs> <laughs> well, th we'll, we'll there, there was a bunch on this on this comment and i was like oh that's really neat and then when i clicked on it it was gone i was like that was really good what what would you would you do <laughs> so Absolutely. whoever that was uh that was brilliant do that again next time please thank you yes that would be fun uh okay so starting off with 31 avp requiem so i had it at 29 it was uncle sean's worst of the bunch brian at 27 liked it more than a few of us and then mm -hmm. uh it was also charles his worst of the bunch so avp requiem uh i mean there's not a whole lot to say about this movie if you if you're into avp stuff it's still avp stuff but it looks like this yeah oh there you go i don't know what you're talking <laughs> I thought you were about. trying to refocus things <laughs> <laughs> he's way ahead of the joke yeah so if you look over here we got a clip of the movie playing yeah, yeah. And, uh... oh look oh man this is the climax right here holy crap <laughs> <laughs> exactly. so um that that's the biggest thing is that when people say a movie is unwatchable they're usually referring to the quality and i think that avp requiem is, is borderline unwatchable just in a, a <laughs> literally <physical> sense um <laughs> Brian, you liked it a bit more than us. I think you are the only one that had it above the original AVP. So sell me on its redeeming qualities. Well, it's, it's not a masterpiece by any stretch. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's just that um, I, I've just I've never b uh, been as down on it as, as most people because um, I wasn't expecting a right lot from it to begin with coming off the back of the first AVP, which I always thought was a bit naff anyway. Mm -hmm. um, You're not I've a Paul W.S. Anderson fan. I know that about you. <laughs> I've, I, I felt like this one did much better character work uh, in the sense that I believed these were real people, not uh, the not these pseudo-scientists that spin out Paul W.S. Anderson lines of dialogue. They just they felt like... <clears throat> felt like real people going about a real town having real problems in which an aliens and predator get thrown into the mix and that's what i wanted uh in, instead of all this nonsense with pyramids and bloody yeah uh it, it it just it's simplistic i preferred it for that reason it's not as bad as people make out but i do agree that the biggest complaint i have is that you can't see a lot of stuff that's going on Mm-hmm. Uncle Sean, CP, anything to add to that? Or we pretty much covered the issues. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, yeah. it's both all it's, you know, dark aliens on a dark background with low lighting mm. and it's close ups. It's quick cuts. It's all the things that make it so you have no idea what's going on. Yeah. So even the schlocky fun gets lost and I, it. No. It just, yeah. I was, I was just going to say the editing is is kind of choppy to say the most polite thing about it. it it's 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 bad and, and when we talked about this one one of the previous 31 ones i brought this up but like i know it's horror it's supposed to be horrifying this one just had stuff that's just like off-putting like a woman's <laughs> about to give birth and the alien comes in and like ramps the deal down her throat ah! the mm. alien's like staring at a bunch of newborn babies like okay I think I found my line. I think I know what I did in one of my horror movies. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, th Here's a quick little fun story about AVP that's only going to take like a minute. So back whenever uh, I first discovered that you could actually bootleg movies, and I was a young teenager, and I was like, oh my god, the possibilities. 
Um, rather than just put it into a USB drive like a smart person, I was like, I'm going to burn all of these onto a DVD. And I oh. went through the trouble of making like the menu and having chapter breaks and like going through. I think I spent five hours making an AVP Requiem DVD <laughs> just oh. to watch it and go, oh. That was a waste. <laughs> <laughs> Not oh, even Fox took that long with it. <laughs> I'm telling you, there's like here, just no cover art, just push play. Uh, okay, <laughs> one super chat that actually goes right into our next one. Though I'm curious of all eight Robocop movies included in this 31 on 31. I mm. am not aware of the other four. Eight. They edited the TV the, show into movies. Those, uh, yeah, four made, four made for TV uh, movies, and they're not good. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. You learn something new every day. Uh, speaking of that, number 30, RoboCop 3. Uh, Sean and Brian agreed, and they had the correct number, and me and Charles agreed, and we're a little more forgiving on it, I guess. Uh, this was one of two first-time watches for me. I had never seen the RoboCop sequels before we did this video. And uh, RoboCop 2 was a little bit better than what I was expecting, but RoboCop 3 was pretty much exactly what I was expecting, being that I never really hear anybody talk about any RoboCop movies besides the first one. Um, it took me a few minutes to realize that Peter Weller wasn't RoboCop, <laughs> which I'm going to let Brian continue on with that rant. But I thought it was funny that it's the guy who plays Cousin Mickey from Rescue Me and the guy from Thinner. Uh, it, just a real goofy, schlocky 90s action film. Oh, my uh, God, that's right. Yeah, White the, the biggest thing town. that I was laughing about is the ninja where he's supposed to be like, it's built up the whole movie. We're going to get this awesome fight. And then like Robocop's just like on the ground sitting up while he's dancing around doing ninja things. And then he gets he gets like a, a smile glitch every once in a while. Um, Brian, <laughs> how long did it take you to know that it wasn't Peter Weller? Since I know you just adore Peter Weller in the role and well, I, nobody can replace Peter Weller. I went in knowing it's not Peter Weller, um, and it, it just made zero difference whatsoever. <laughs> but uh, it's just, it's like, um, what is required from Robocop is a guy to put up with wearing a BS suit and walk around for two hours doing this and talking in a monotone voice. Um, it's the reason. Sylvester Stallone did not want to wear a helmet for a whole Judge Dredd film because when that happens, all you need is someone to wear a... It just... It's like people... The amount of comments I've had on my reviews and on 31 about, oh, you should have seen the behind-the-scenes footage on the Robocop DVD in which Peter Weller underwent some uh, specialist physical training with experts in AI. And I'm like, oh, really? <laughs> and, and do we have, like, these AI of which we can be taught how they should officially move? It's just total bollocks. It's like... Yeah, sorry, anyone could play that role. Anyone could play that role. Um, there is zero that Peter Weller brings to Robocop that distinguishes it as a performance for our times. Well, Kane Hodder would make Robocop breathe heavy with his lungs, so that might be a little different. Mm. Yeah. Uh, it's, yeah, it's bollocks. It's not... It, the, the, the thing that you remember from a performance standpoint in that film is Kurtwood Smith, who knows the film he's in, has a blast with it. I um, think you're getting ahead of where we're at. We're in RoboCop 3. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but we were talking about Peter Weller's um, thing, and it's just like, so... <laughs> you said you wanted a two-hour live stream. This is going to go two hey. hours on RoboCop 3. CP's done the most talking so far in this stream, so don't give me that nonsense. Uh, I'll, you I'll, asked I'll me take my a opinion. half an hour break. It's true. You asked me, we'll you asked me, you asked we'll me my a, opinion. We'll put a but, pin in the Peter yeah. Weller rant because we got yeah. a couple more. Yeah. Uh, I have a lot of nostalgia for this movie. I saw it in the theater when it came out. I remember seeing advertisements in my Nintendo Power for the movie, uh, which is hmm. funny that they're advertising this vicious, sadistic sci-fi franchise to children um <clears throat> and um but you know it's not great but I, i'm actually pretty offended because they put robocop in fortnite and his glider isn't the the jetpack 
What's that about? That's all I have to say about Robocop. I was offended at the fact that I've went over a decade now without realizing that Iron Man's a complete Robocop 3 ripoff. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> the ball's on Disney, I'm telling you. Mm. <clears throat> all right. Uh, moving on to 29. This one was my 31, and that is Alien 3. So it was my worst of the bunch. Um, Brian... A lot more forgiving on it. Uh, Willie Screedia at 23 and Uncle Sean at 29. Not too much higher. And uh, the biggest thing that I can say about this movie... Here's a nice piece of shit. <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> hey, wait, is right now... We, am I three for three that my... I have the right numbers for all three of these thus far? Um... 29, 30, 31... <laughs> Wow! <laughs> Robert, you're just, you just a, you're just my ranking. Yeah, you're just a Sean Chandler fan. You cheated. Uh, look, a Alien Three. Look, I, once you get past the opening five minutes, on paper, it's probably a decent bit higher than where I have it. But I've just never been able to get past that. I love Alien so much, and to me, the opening of this kind of destroys. Ripley's character arc of where it was heading it uh, completely destroys the other two characters and it doesn't replace it with anything that's anywhere near as interesting as the first two films so every time I try to watch this and I try to like do this through the first five minutes and then just go on the ride on this little prison planet it's just not a good time for me I mean it's a very bleak movie <laughs> it's a very dark movie narratively and it, visually and mm. just all leading to Ripley having to die and everything it's just it, it's not a movie that i ever enjoy watching you, you see some some early david fincher promise in there but it's just a movie that every time i go to it i'm like you know i would rather watch a bad alien movie than one that just pisses me off when i watch it um i know sean i know you're, you're very similar feelings um yeah but, it's uh, it's the movie i hate the most doesn't mean it's the worst movie i always struggle to know what to do with that because there's uh, when it's the movie that just angers me the most because of the first five minutes where you undo all the victory of aliens and replace it with the girl drowns in her sleep and then Ripley watches as she has, <laughs> they do an autopsy on her and then there's a dog that's like uh, uh, on the ground and then it's guts burst out. So everything that's like, oh, once again, I know it's horror. I think I found a few of my lines through Alien vs. Predator <laughs> Requiem and Alien 3. But, I mean, Absolutely. you can see David Fincher's promise, but mm -hmm. it's a movie just killed by a bad script and having no script while they were shooting it at first, or an incomplete script while they were shooting it first. Yeah, and, and I always have everybody, too, they're like, you gotta watch the assembly cut, and I'm like, well, the assembly cut still has the same basic story and the same opening, so yeah. it really doesn't fix... <laughs> my biggest problem it with makes it. It's, more it's, it's sense better, it it's a better, better put together version yeah but it's Th thematically it's richer i would say yeah um, i just i just i think uh I, i'm i'm someone who anyone who says i really don't like alien 3 because of what they do to newt and hicks i'm like i can totally understand that and i've got no problem with someone having that opinion um i'm i'm just i've always and and i was that person back when i so when I first saw this, it was on video. Uh, I couldn't go to the cinema to see it because I was a bit too young. Saw it on video, and at the time I was a huge fan of Aliens, massive fan of Aliens, still am, obviously. Uh, and yeah, I had the same gut reaction as as you guys, and I hated it for years. Um, eventually, I got around to seeing the Assembly Cut when that was released on DVD, and I j I just. I went into it knowing, look, I hate the beginning. I hate, I hate what they've done there. But if that's what happens, if if they if if, if you know if, if those characters were to be dispensed with like that at the beginning, then what's the character journey for Ripley as a result of that? As a grieving mother, as a, a, a as someone who has now yes. lost all hope. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so and and I think it explores that as best it can so yeah the, the the conceit central conceit is a flawed one it's annoying for fans but if that's the seat the conceit you've you've set up how do you deal with that from ripley's perspective and i think that fincher does as good a job as you possibly could 
exploring that and and taking us down the road that Ripley goes on. Um, there's some really great supporting characters, and there's a lot of again the assembly cut. It deals a lot with a lot thematically with regards to belief in God and uh, the you know an evil force uh, as it is viewed by the prisoners and and this that and the other and the sacrifice. Uh, of of Ripley at the end, so uh, yeah, um, yeah, certainly flawed, but uh, with some redeeming qualities for me personally. But. Charles, anything to add? Yeah, I I, I rank the assembly cut. Um, I I mean I, I don't disagree with anything about the beginning. It's kind of why Terminator Dark Fate. When we get to it, we'll get there. <laughs> um, <laughs> It's 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 a perfectly fine entry into this series, as far as I'm concerned. It's just not pretty, mm-hmm. like it even for Fincher, like some of that that fisheye stuff. I, I, like, I, I get it. I, I get I get why those shots are being done like that, but I it, it's not appealing to me, especially without much color. It, it's I don't I don't like looking at it, but but. I'll tolerate it, oddly enough. Well, speaking of something that's pretty to look at, Sean, you just yeah, grew just exponentially. <laughs> you got his hate out for Alien 3, and it's just like... <laughs> Moving on to 28, we've got The Matrix Revolutions, and we end Uncle Sean's oh. hot streak. Uh, oh, wow. So I had oh, it the man. lowest. Uh, Brian and um, CP just barely above me, and then Sean was actually the most forgiving on it. Now, this is a movie that when I remember when Matrix Reloaded came out and I was excited as hell. I was in junior high. And when I saw that, it was just not the movie that I wanted. Uh, It's still not the movie that I want. And so I didn't even bother seeing Matrix Revolutions in theaters. That's the only one I have not seen in theaters. I saw it on when it came out on DVD, watched it at home with my parents. They barely made it past the point where he's stuck in that like subway limbo and they checked out. Um, I don't know if they've ever actually finished the movie, to be honest with you. But when I watch it, I mean, there, there's some coolness to the finality of it, which is not final anymore. <laughs> but at the time, uh, you know, the, the big Zion battle was interesting to look at in spots. Uh, the big epic battle where, you know, seven billion Smiths are going to watch him fight one Smith. Uh, there was there's things about it that I'm like, OK, I can I can watch this and be like, eh, it's interesting. But just narratively, I don't really think either well any of the the matrix sequels work for me so this is just the one that works least for me um whoever wants to jump in whoever has passionate thoughts about revolutions well it's a movie that um the franchise sets it up is that it's all about the humans defeating the robots and then this movie changes the goalpost (laughs) to we're trying to stop agent smith yeah and And we're gonna make a deal with the robots and we do it it's like (laughs) We have a ceasefire. We're still <laughs> stuck underground, just waiting for the robots to change their mind. But Smith's no longer a threat. You go, how did you guys so utterly miss the point of your own franchise? It's like, how did you so miss what the point was to be? As soon as they to bring Smith back in the second one, they threw the whole thing off. Yeah, I'm with you. I, I know, um, I think it was Brian and... and and Woody, the guy that does our uh, the graphic design for me and everything like that, we're, we're talking a lot about some of the more biblical themes of uh, these movies. So, Brian, how does that work for you with Revolutions? Because I know you like it a decent oh, it, bit. It, do, it doesn't. Me. That's that's the problem. Because it, it feels like Reloaded is all the philosophy and, and ideas and mind-bending concepts and you feel like when I came out of Reloaded I was like Revolutions is just going to blow our minds because the there's, there's stuff they like dissected here they're really going to un- unpack in the next film mm-hmm. and they don't unpack it they just blow a load of crap up it's just, I just it's literally just an action movie in which stuff blows up and r- big robots hit each other and, and you're just like what what happened? 
<laughs> I literally reloaded and revolutions could have been one movie um, and, and revolutions could have just been toned down to like a half hour action fest at the end of, Revo of, of reloaded and the whole experience would have been much better for it but it's just yeah it, it was a sh it was just disappointing as an action movie it's pretty decent but it's uh, but that's about it whereas the first and second film they always mixed that action Yep. with philosophy and you know all the different kind of world views and religions kind of mingled into one pot to explore ideas about where we come from why we're here is there a god uh, you know ai the the nature of man and and then yeah the third film is just no we're just gonna blow stuff up yeah <laughs> that's why I have the highest of all the four of us. CP, I know you're not the biggest fan of the Matrix franchise. Do you yeah. want to talk about this one or just elaborate on the others? Yeah, it it it, it certainly didn't sell me on it and it's it's strange. The original Matrix was so incredible with the things they did. Like when you watch the behind the scenes for the, the bullet mm -hmm. time thing, that mm -hmm. was all done with like a 500,000 cameras and then you get the ending of this and it's just uh, a PlayStation game it it looks bad like like yeah. real bad yeah totally I'll say this uh this movie was probably top 3 most disappointing films I've ever seen in a theater for me wow. I've come around a little bit over the last few years rewatching it and having watched some like matrix uh, explained videos that kind of get got me sucked into the lore a little bit more but in the theater I was like wow how did a matrix movie come out that made me feel so little well at least yeah. felt a lot of things they were positive but none of the things I was supposed to feel I think mm -hmm. as well it shows just how much throwing money at stuff does not help it at all yeah. like the first matrix film is actually quite a low budget yeah for mm -hmm. the genre for what the it genre. is yeah it's like it was it wasn't a franchise at that point the the producers like didn't even know if it was going to work it was just like okay we've got these wachowskis they've they've off of bound right yeah wasn't, off of wasn't bound. Bound before yep. that? Yeah, yeah yeah and it's just and it's just yeah. like it's, it's not <laughs> for, for what you've never get, seen it but i know enough <laughs> it's yeah. really good you really it's, should it's not a big budget movie and uh, when you look at a lot of the stuff in it it holds up because a lot of the stuff you see in is physical yeah. it's mm -hmm. physical stuff well that tends to be to the, the case seat. for just about all of these franchises right the more money that they pad it yeah. with, the worse that it ends up looking it's just like oh, i just throw just throw some cgi yeah. and it's just like it's big doesn't equal better it just means you've got to throw it out to more special effects companies you it's so kind of the time and energy is divided so much anyway they, they that's why jurassic park still looks better than most cgi fest films mm. today because there was so the little Jurassic cgi Park. being done yeah it's taylor's old as time Park, not world. practical's better uh all right moving on yeah to... practical like like spielberg did in park practical with a you know with a, with a hint of cgi if you need help but start practical and like a fear of CGI, a fear, like knowing, well, this might not look good. Right. So let's put the CGI in the dark. Let's do it for these shots. And mm -hmm. an understanding that you have to like intertwine it. And so you actually have movie magic going on where you don't know what's real, what's multiple cameras, what's mm. CGI. And so you just get sucked into it and you can just accept it. Whereas, you know, when you have Neo fighting all these, you know, thousand Smiths, you look at it, and you go, those, those are all CGI. <laughs> They, they look like rubber band people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. As as CP said earlier, it's like we're we're watching a PlayStation Two game. A uh, couple of super chats. We got Daniel Skinner. I will die on a hill saying the Matrix should not have been a franchise, especially mm. considering I've seen all four movies back to back five times. <gasps> uh, I will die on that hill with you, sir. And uh, the stop motion in Alien Three looks bad in 2022. Also, which of the 31 on 31s had the best and worst movie? Uh, what? Exorcist 2 is probably the worst movie for me that we've covered in a 31 on 31. Uh, oh, as far as oh, best, oh. probably the one that's my number one in this one. 
Yeah, like the top five in this one. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Well, the the direct the directors when we did the Nolan and Tarantino. Mm, okay. And, okay. Yeah, yeah. 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 That's true. So, okay. Obviously, we've had some good ones. <laughs> yeah. We've had some shitty ones. All right. Uh, Twenty-seven. We've got Alien Resurrection, and apparently I'm smoking crack on this one. <laughs> so I've, got, I've got it at 17. <laughs> Next is Uncle Sean at 24, and uh, Brian and CP, not fans, not fans of Alien Resurrection. This is one of those movies that I have to 100% attribute to nostalgia, because I watched it on uh, VHS as a kid. I really enjoyed it as a kid, uh, like it, just the action, the characters, the underwater sequences, stuff like that. And so it's a movie that as an adult, I see a lot more of the rough edges, but I still have a lot of fun with it. Like it, it, it's probably like on paper, it's a worse directed, worse written movie than Alien 3. But I can have fun with this one. I can have fun with the zany cast. I can have fun with the whatever amount of Joss Whedon's script was left by the end of it. Uh, I can have fun with the fact that we've got horror alumni out the ass in this movie. I mean, you got Chucky in here and you got Ron Perlman and Winona Ryder and Michael Wincott and the underwater sequence and some of the other action sequences I have a lot of fun with. Um, the, the, the human hybrid thing at the end, you know, <laughs> even, even kid Cody didn't quite know how to decipher that one. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I don't know. This is a movie that I would never try to like defend or die on a hill with, but I can enjoy <clears throat> it for what it is. Let's face it. It is really just a big budget remake of Critters 4 with the same actor. <laughs> even Brad Dourif is in both <laughs> movies. You got a spaceship that docks with a military uh, uh, kind of station. Turns out there's experiments going on on there with the aliens that run amok, and it's it's and it's got Brad Dourif in it. It's the it's it's the same film, yo, except Critters Four is better. Oh my god! Uh, okay, hang on, hang on. Somehow we hang always on. get. <laughs> <laughs> Knew that was coming. Gotta bring critters into it somewhere. Yeah. I know. Look, I, 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 <coughs> I, I just the thing I despise most in, in 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 a lot of cinema is when you have so much money to spend, you know, in these big Hollywood productions when they just throw money at it, and this is what you get. It's like it pisses me off no end because there's so many creative people out there that I'm sure could do a much better job with much less. Oh, yeah. The, you know, we, I mean, we've seen it with fan films, for crying out loud, where fans will take oh. a fraction of a budget and actually do something that sits quite well within, you know, the, the realm of the films that they're aping. Uh, so, yeah, it just, to me, it's... I, I look at Alien Resurrection, I'm like, what the hell happened? Clearly, th there was some. There was a good idea in there. There was some good stuff in the film, but when it's just one of those films. The more I've watched it over the years, the more it just like uh, it makes me cringe. Um, and how much snot seriously has to drip from the aliens? <laughs> <laughs> it seems like one of those one. movies that um, I'm not really even sure where it got so far off base because the basic idea doesn't sound terrible. But then, especially with everything we know about Joss Whedon's career over the last 25 years, he's a terrible pick to write a alien movie. <laughs> and then, so he writes one that's a has a lot of Joss Whedon-y wit to it. And then they give it to someone who English isn't their first language. <laughs> and there's some limitations in how much English he does know. Like, all right, let me film this thing that isn't so based around a guy's clever wit with the English language. Mm-hmm. What could possibly go wrong? The mm. wrong guy wrote the script and the wrong guy tried to film it. Yeah. yeah. It's amazing the kick in the nuts quality wise that we go from the first two alien films to the next two alien films. Right. <laughs> it's it, like the stop start nature of it. The way you end, uh, you know, the, the way you begin Alien 3 sucks ass. The, the way you end Alien 3 is, is, a, is an ending. Yep. Ripley does the sacrifice thing and nope never mind we got a clone oh okay so um 
whatever, whatever. We're just going to Halloween for this and just keep going and, until Sigourney Weaver doesn't want paychecks anymore. Hey, you said Halloween, and we got like 50 more viewers in a second now. <laughs> <laughs> Quick super chat. Alien Resurrection is the only movie I can recall that had Ripley, Chucky, Hellboy, and Tuco all in one movie. Absolutely. It's got a great cast. The cast was not the problem. Maybe the, the script they were handed. All right. Oh. This one's going to be fun. Number 26. Dun, 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 dun. Terminator 3, Rise uh -huh. of the Machines. Brian Lomax... Famous and infamous 31. in equal Ooh. amounts for his disdain for this one. Uh, Uncle Sean, most forgiving. CP just barely under that. And then me just barely under that. So, um, Brian, I'm going to go ahead and uh, take the wheel for you. Fuck you, asshole. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. That's all that needs to be said. <laughs> I find it really entertaining. Like, like again... This is a movie just like Alien Resurrection. That if I did not see it in the theaters when I was a kid, I'd be fascinated to, to see what my reception of it. Like, if it just came out today, I would probably walk out pissed and would be ready to do a rant video. Like, what are you doing? Why is Arnold Schwarzenegger stripping? What is going on? Like, so many things that when I hear you describe how much of an abomination the movie is to you, I'm like, yeah. Yeah, he's right. Yeah. But for some reason... The Terminator franchise, even at its worst, I can't help but still enjoy it on some level. Yeah, 100%. That's what I yeah. was going to say. No matter what they do, they can do Genesis, and I'm still like, oh, that's kind of a fun, weird little experiment. Yeah, exactly. It's I'm a like, heck of a lot better but... than this one. <laughs> yeah, it's weird. Something about Terminator is just, it's got this charm to it to where I'm, I'm ultra forgiving on it. Uh, but, uh, Brian, I know you've said it ad nauseum, but if you want to. <laughs> if you want to I, elaborate on that clip at all, go ahead. I don't understand people who say it's not as bad as Genesis. At least Genesis tries to do yep. something new. At least it takes the franchise. Well, this one has a, a girl Terminator. That's different. Totally. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and she could yeah. change her boob size. So <laughs> yeah. I, two yeah. stars clever. extra. <laughs> it's like, okay, so, right, we have the T1000 guys completely liquid metal man okay now we've got the next evolutionary step in the terminator it's something that's not quite as advanced <laughs> it's like that it's, a problem that the franchise has until dark fate i'll add <laughs> it's just like okay so you're gonna send back something now that isn't quite as revolutionary as a t-1000 you've got no place to go mm-hmm it's stupid, and it's literally born off the idea of some asshole suit in some room somewhere going, we got to get a female Terminator in here. We can flash her boobs and everything. She'll be fit. She'll be hot. We can stick her all over the posters. It's just like... And then I look at what they do to Arnie in the film, and it's very much akin to what they're doing with Thor right now in the Marvel Universe, <gasps> where he's barely recognisable from the the, 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 the the character that he was in the, in the first movies. Um, talk to the Hand, Elton John sunglasses. It's just, you're, 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 you're trying to make him into a joke, and it's like no matter what Cameron did with him, even like moments when he tried to use bits of humour... It was humor that still felt rooted in in not just oh let's poke some fun and <laughs> well, that's funny. It's a just, silly face. He's smiling. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it was through John Connor's character that that humor came yeah. from. Yeah. It was his response to this right, machine right. rather than oh let's just stick a pair of funny glasses on him and let's let's constantly 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 reference the first two movies to the nth degree that actually we're just going to rehash the story from the first two movies there's just there's nothing original about it it takes everything that's great about the first two and just does them a lot worse um, I, I, I don't understand anyone saying they love this film and that scene in which Arnie has to try and act hold it, withholding his emotion and he starts bashing that car and it just it feels like a fan film in the worst possible sense and again it's a weird it's like, spot in his career too because this is where he started to like man. yeah I don't really want to do movies anymore I want to yeah. go be a governor and then like 
you know, we got that for a, a number of years, and then he slowly started to come back. So it's a really weird spot in his career, too, even yeah. though it's his signature role, yeah. where you can kind of look on his face and be like, he's checked out. He's got other mm -hmm. things on his mind right now. Uh, and of two things, all the people who have played John Connor, yes. Nick Stahl has zero of any of the qualities <laughs> oh, that this I would is... expect. For, like, right. I do not see that guy becoming the leader of the resistance yeah. for humanity at all. Mm -hmm. The weakest actually, cast is yeah. absolutely Claire Danes, Claire Danes maybe, but him. Yeah. Took the no words way. out of my mouth, because she's one of the main things that I do like about this, and she feels more like a leader in this movie than he does. Mm. Uh, I like her a lot. I like the whole twist about the fact that, well, if you call it a twist, that she sent the Terminator back, and he now answers to her, like, a small deviation from the, the formula of the second film. And I think it ends on a cool note where it's like oh shit okay judgment day is just gonna happen mm. well which damn. no also which, find the end which. of humanity cool mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is this this is and this is one of the things that pisses me off about all these naysayers for for dark fate mm -hmm. because they always say oh you've just killed john connor so you've completely done away with everything that he achieved in terminator 2 no that happened in terminator 3 when they said there's actually nothing he did in terminator 2 stopped judgment day valid point that i didn't so, even bring uh, up in my extra rant <laughs> at, at least in dark fate we'll what they're there. doing is they're setting a different timeline so it's shooting off where you don't know what that judgment what? day looks like and when it happens mm -hmm. so it's a completely new story whereas with 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 this one you're literally doing away with everything that he did in terminator 2 well, when you're no, saying, no well no we, we, didn't, we, we, didn't make we, any with, difference with the exception of three and four each of the movies does away with the previous timeline yeah this is a it's funny a, franchise. three and four that, actually <laughs> Every every time they come back to it, they're like, "All right, we're gonna start from scratch, and we're gonna go ahead and green light three movies." Oh shit, that didn't. <laughs> yeah, work. I know. Right, we're gonna start yeah, from scratch, and we're gonna green light three movies. New oh, trilogy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> but but it's only Dark Fate that people seem to have a problem. Yeah, with we'll that. get there, Brian. Over. Trust me. So, me and yeah. me and you are gonna have a, a a fun time when we get to that one. Much later in the stream, I might add. Bitches. Anyway, I'd like um, to add. I also think Nick Stahl is horribly miscast. Yes, just, oh, and yeah. I like talking like, but yeah, yeah, just yeah. none of like you don't believe he could be who John Connor's supposed to be at all. Get he's supposed to be broken, but there's not even that hint or tease of any strength. And even no. that one scene where they try to force it, where he's just like, "Let go, of you fucking machine." He's like, "There, there you go. That's the John Connor." And I'm yeah. like, because he said the f word. What the? <laughs> okay, no. yeah, I'm I'm leading some serious motherfuckers at the end of the, <laughs> the timeline then. All right. The <laughs> sorry, no, no, no. Sorry, sorry. Devonta Brown. Is that an argument? Well, Dark Fate is a direct sequel to Part Two. Well, so is this one. Oh God. Yeah. Okay. We'll get there. <laughs> <laughs> Put the lid on the jar. Uh, the Matrix Resurrections. So uh, we're all pretty close on this one. Brian being just a little bit more forgiving on it. This is Resurrections is the newest one. Okay. So twenty-five. Sean yet Ooh, again is is correct here. I think that uh, Robert Alex, I found your formula. We'll just take Sean's ranking and change maybe five of them, and <laughs> there's your average. Uh, but no, okay. So Re Matrix Resurrections. Uh, this is a movie that I never got excited for, um, mostly because I just didn't like two and three. Uh, but the trailers, the fact that it seemed more so that WB just wanted to pull something out of their back pocket to reignite a franchise more than an actual cool idea. The fact that only one of the Wachowskis was coming back. I saw nothing but red flags with this thing. Mm. But I tried to go in with an open mind. And uh, I ended up being mixed on the fact that they, they went so bold with it. But the fact that they kind of went meta and that, like, you know, the Matrix are video games and all this other stuff was different. But it was, yet again, continuing the Matrix in a way that was just not as cool, not as exciting, yeah. not as interesting, not as fresh, not as anything as the first film. Which is why, at this point, I'm still like, why did we ever need sequels to that first one? It was perfect. Mm -hmm. uh, but it just, it's the action that really lets me down in this. Because it's, it's more digestible as far as the lore and the philosophy and everything to me than the second and the third film is. But all of the action sequences is just Neo doing this. Like, even when they try to recreate you mean the whole... John Wick. 
Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, w w even when you get the recreation of the the whole kung fu training sequence, it's just eventually he just does the Superman push, the Jedi push, and I'm just like, that is not interesting to me. And that's one of the things that from Reloaded onward made Neo less interesting is that he can just force push everybody. He can fly, and it's just like, well, the hand to hand combat that was gritty and realistic in a sci fi fashion in the first film was what was so cool about it. So this one ended up not working for me very much. Um, it's actually uh, it, all three of the sequels are not separated by much for me. They're all just ideas that I don't particularly care for. Yeah, I um, the, the, the fact that this came out over 20 years after the original film mm -hmm. with so many advances in technology and for the Wachowskis to like have over 15 years to think up new creative things to do visually with technology. And there's, there's not like one interesting, cool shot. Well, apparently Warner went to the Wachowskis and said, Hey, we're making a fourth you in. And the Wachowskis are like, no. And then Warner is like, well, we're just going to do it anyway. And Lana's like, well, <laughs> <laughs> and there is a conspiracy theory out there that she made like a, a movie poking fun at WB and everything yeah. and the whole concept as like a, a fuck you because yeah, that, they made her make the movie. That whole like meta, the the, the 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 crew behind the marketing of the video game, like that was totally uh, a wink about Hollywood. Mm -hmm. That That's where I gave the movie credit where it was like, oh, I know what this is. Good for you, um, but I still can't buy into your franchise. And I they apologize. ultra focus on the romance side of things, which even in the first film, the romance between Neo and Trinity has never really been the strongest element to me. Even in the first film, I don't really feel like it's that strong. It's no. fine. It works, no. but it doesn't. It, I, had, I, actually think that's, I actually think that's the strongest element of the latest one. Um, and I think that comes with the oh, age. Geez. So I, think it too. I think it comes with the age of the the the, the characters um and just I, I think there's more soul in them now at the age they're at and they've li lived experience so seeing so a lot of the quieter scenes between those two really work for me in this one in ways that they didn't in the original i wasn't bothered about the the you know the romance between those two in the original i just wanted the action whereas here the action's like eh. um but i actually i am more fond of the characters and how they interact with each other in in the new one and that's kind of what i liked about it there's actually an investment in the relationship not just look our two hot leads one's a boy yeah. one's a girl look let's have them yeah. kiss like mm. Mm. I can agree with that. There's more focus on it, so it feels more organic to the, the story. It's just that element of this franchise has never been, even in my top 10 elements of it. Um, Bruce with a Y, post T3, the trilogy of failed trilogies. Pretty much. <laughs> what if the Terminator in T3 doesn't have a physical form, but is a virus that can float through the air and take control of any de device? Cool or dumb idea? Uh, it's Without seeing it physically, it seems like a decent idea. Um, they might as well give him a lightsaber. Yeah, pretty much. That's how I felt about it. Uh, okay, 24. We've got the Total Recall remake. Again, I'm smoking crack on this one. No, well, actually, Brian's not too bad there. So this is one of two remakes in this um, 31 on 31 that I just don't feel like get as much credit as they deserve. And I think they both had the same problem. Um one is that they're remakes of Paul Verhoeven films that take the <laughs> PG-13 action route when when you have Paul Verhoeven going ultra Verhoeven and, and rated R, wacky, crazy, and Robocop especially, ultra violence, by default, you're not going to be as memorable or as interesting as that. But um, th both of the biggest flaws of the Total Recall and the Robocop remake is that there's another movie to compare them to. I think if the Total right. Recall remake existed as just its own thing i actually think people would be pretty favorable on it because i i love the cast uh i really like um not as interesting as arnold schwarzenegger's version but i do like uh colin farrell in the role i really like kate beckinsale in the role of the the sharon stone um character 
I think there's some pretty inventive things that they do. One of my biggest requirements that I want out of a remake, especially if it's a classic, is do something different with it. And I think they do quite a bit different here. Getting rid of the Mars thing, having the whole, you know, it, through the middle of the Earth traversal system and going more with robots and AI and stuff like that. So uh, aside from the fact that it just doesn't have as much grit and doesn't have near as much style and things to really stand out as the original. I, I have a lot of fun with the Total Recall remake. No, I, I agree. Oh, no, yeah, CP, go ahead. I, I agree with you. It, it's just, if you call this the the Earth Score Elevator movie, <laughs> I, I, I might... I Great might. title. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write that down. <laughs> I'm selling tickets as we speak. <laughs> uh, just, just why, why, why did you copy total recall in title like you you're just trying to sell a name and then this is something totally different like you said and and rated pg-13 at best uh, on top of that so well, isn't it isn't it based on a book by philip k dick mm -hmm. yeah. we'll remember it for you wholesale i believe is the title yeah. which yeah. is funny because this movie also gets rid of all of the ambiguity of that concept yes yeah it it just I don't know. I I I can't. I couldn't, and I hate that I can't. But I couldn't unsee the Verhoeven version. So it's just just. And that's fair. There's there's two different ways to watch this movie as well as RoboCop. You either watch it as its own thing, or you watch it as another version of the, the original. And right. you're going to come out with two very different receptions. Yeah, I mean, maybe it's because I, I mean, I've just I've been watching the original film for 30 years, one of those early ultra violent R rated movies I got to see. And it's such a distinct flavor. Mm -hmm. And this just feels totally generic to me. Mm -hmm. I love yeah. the cast, like a lot of Len Weissman stuff. And I just watch a movie that just strips away everything that made the original one unique, interesting, whether the Philip K. Dick ideas, Paul Verhoeven, ultra violence, satire, comedy, weirdness, and you just kind of get generic chases constantly from beginning to end. Uh, but they Colin kept the Farrell three... wasn't but... carrying that movie as far as I'm concerned yeah. either. But they kept the three-boobed hooker. They did. <laughs> Not that element, <laughs> even though there's no mutants in this movie. <laughs> Wait, and that's what's kind of the, the movie had like a nonstop stream of like these very just on the nose references where they just state a thing from the previous one without any context, without it meaning anything. Yeah. And mm -hmm. it was just like, uh, even the way you're doing Easter eggs is annoying me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, they had to have that. They, they like, <laughs> we we're calling it Total Recall, three tips. <laughs> Those are the two things we need. <laughs> Brian, anything to add or are we moving on? I, 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 I think Sean's right in the sense that it has a very generic feel about it, but I do think Len Wiseman knows how to shoot action. And mm -hmm. whenever there's action happening in the film, I'm suitably entertained. So Yeah, it's, it's watchable. Mm -hmm. yeah. I won't remember it, but it's watchable. Exactly. It comes out in the in the 2010s where there's very similar movies, like where I'd, I'd rather watch yeah. Elysium than this kind of sci-fi action-y stuff. Hey, Dale. Elysium oh, is still my off, favorite sorry. film from uh, that guy, actually. What is it? Elysium. Elysium's, Elysium's still my favorite film from that director, Neil Blomkamp. I'm with you on that one. I'll die on that. Didn't hill. he just have something come out this year? A year ago. Yeah, I did not watch it. No uh, one did. <laughs> <laughs> 23. Uh, this one, old Charles is real down on Terminator Genesis. Uh, what? Uh, Uncle Sean <laughs> is the highest, and then me and Brian there in the middle. Uh, Terminator Genesis. This, it, look, on paper, Stupid, ridiculous. Another Terminator film. It's like, what are you on doing? screen as well? well <laughs> <laughs> but see my comments on Terminator 3, even at its worst and its weirdest and its mm -hmm. dumbest ideas, I'm still like, I'm enjoying myself. And mm -hmm. the thing about going back and retooling the events of the first film and getting an old Terminator and making Sarah Connor the badass that now has to kind of court um, Kyle Reese, despite the fact that he's played by Jai Courtney. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of ideas in this movie that I really enjoy. 
uh, one of two movies in this franchise that for some reason the trailer's like, here's all the twists and turns <laughs> and everything. Here you go, guys. Mm. Uh, but yeah, it, it's what separates Terminator 3, Terminator Genesis. To me, they're, they're similar in quality as far as what are you doing. But one of them, as Brian said earlier, tries a lot of new things and tries to do a lot of things we haven't seen in the franchise where the other one is just, let's just redo the first two films. So I, I can have fun with Genesis. Um pretty much the end of my thoughts there uh cpu not a fan <laughs> I, I i listen when it comes to time travel movies you you, you got me you got me a time travel mm -hmm. but this this is to the terminator franchise as alien resurrection is to alien it, it it's it's got a lot of ideas it's just too many and they don't seem like they're very well fleshed out and the the like you said the, the twist uh I, I had the mistake of watching the trailer like the, the the twist being that that john is is this new i don't know what the hell magnetic type of whatever the hell it is now yeah it, it's another just, thing where they're like how do we top the t-1000 what did we do there's yeah. nowhere to go <laughs> yeah it, it 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 just it just felt like it, the, it all right so what 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 timeline are we in what are we affecting it, it, it at, at every stage it just felt so like on the fly because they they they, they, sh they would show the original terminator but oh with a twist and then th there's all these moments where it, it, I just sloppy, sloppy, just like I'm talking right now. And to Brian's point as well, this is another film that completely erases Terminator 2 and right. the victories of Terminator 2 and the things we love about Terminator 2, but it doesn't get near the anger. It it's, well, it's too it much turns, of a joke, I think. Yeah. To care. <laughs> it turns John Connor into the very enemy he was hunting down. If, right. if anything, that's more of an insult than that. But, um, I just... <laughs> Me and Brian are going to carry that flag. I think oh, Sean man. as well. Just be like, come on, let's go! <laughs> I just... I, I think this film would get one extra star higher if Jai Courtney was recast. Yeah. <laughs> right. um, I can agree with that. I can agree it, with that. Yeah. And, and this this is coming from someone who was deeply saddened by James Gunn killing Captain Boomerang in in the Suicide Squad. Mm. Um, but uh, the only but role I, that I've seen him absolutely <laughs> nail. There's, there, there was one other, but uh, yeah, there's uh, but um, but yeah, it's just like he he's not Kyle Reese. He is mm. not Kyle Reese. I still see uh, Bruce Willis's son every time that I see him, and I can't get past oh, that. Man. I'll be as yeah. bold to say as a Targaryen or Tenarian, whatever the heck her name is from uh, Game of Thrones, oh. is is no Sarah Connor either. I think she does a decent enough job at trying to emulate it, but yeah, you can't really... That, that's a character you can't recast. Mm. Uh, moving on to twenty. Two and we have some extreme differences here. Um, we've got <laughs> 30 for me, Uncle Sean, just a couple above, and then a good jump before you hit Brian, and then an even bigger jump before you hit Charles over here. So, yeah, the Predator. Um, this is still since I've been on YouTube, this is the most disappointing movie experience that I've had since I've become a quote unquote critic. I I would have bet body parts that this was going to be like the Predator movie to bring this franchise back to its glory days. I mean, the fact that Shane Black was writing and directing, one of my favorite writers and directors working today, um, the fact that he was in the original movie made me think, that, like, okay, this is going to be extreme, extreme care given to this. And I don't know what I saw. I mean, it just, you watch it and it's just kind of, it's almost incoherent because of all of the behind the scenes stuff that, they deleted an entire act out of the movie and reshot yep. it, but kept dialogue referencing the deleted act. And uh, I didn't think that any of the Shane Black dialogue was even very good in here, which was the, probably the most shocking thing where I'm like, at least it's going to be funny. And you got characters and actors that I like. And I didn't think that worked. The big giant CG predator super thing and the spaceship third act and villains being killed off in like a half a second shot where you're like, who is that? And then five minutes later, you realize the villain isn't in the movie anymore. Uh, I could go on and on. This is a movie that just, it's, 
it's a mess. And I don't know if we ever got like the Shane Black cut, if his version is better, because I think there's just some things about the idea that's flawed. But the version that we get to me is just like it's one of the bigger examples out there of just a, a studio and a director on two different planets. Mm. And then you get this thing that they cobble together and sell tickets for. Yeah, I thought it was great, too. <laughs> I love Sean's story about how he saw it. Every time he every time he says it, I'm like, oh. So one man. of my most anticipated movies of 2018, and it mm. came out uh, right as my wife goes into labor. So she's holding our newborn, and I was like, I'm out of here. I gotta go to the movies. Abandon her. <laughs> I'm Everyone's here. crying, <laughs> and she's pulling at my arm. I'm like, get away! There's a new Predator movie, and I went and saw this, and it was pretty disappointing. So um, it also led to four years of marriage trouble as well. That's how bad this movie is. <laughs> I did leave my wife in the hospital after she gave birth, but when you have a baby, you can stay at the hospital for two days. Mm-hmm. So that's All for what a I went. Predator Iron Man suit. Or, yeah, this movie. And every time I watch it, the first 45 minutes, I'm like, eh, this isn't as bad as I remember. And then it just goes off the rails. And it's mm. just nonsense after a certain point in time. And it, it's a movie that just seems like it was built on some really bad ideas. And there wasn't anywhere to go that's good with it. It yeah. just kind of misses what actually people like about Predator. And it's not really convoluted mythology about harvesting DNA and creating hybrids. Brian Rant incoming three, two, one. <laughs> well, I feel like Predator Two goes against that very idea, to be honest. Considering the military were trying to attack this guy and trying to get the Predator so that they could presumably do such experiments on it. Uh, but uh, I, for me, there's, uh, there's there's two issues that kind of stand out. Um, but be, other than these two issues, I have a ton of fun with it. Um, one is that half of the jokes don't really land for me. Yeah. Um, normally with Shane Black, what you're dealing with is two characters, usually of the cop persuasion, um, and they have very kind of clashing personalities, and you stick with them for the majority of the movie, so it's all about them, he gets to flesh them out, this that and the other uh so you grow to love those characters there's no no you don't really get that here because he's dealing with so many characters which you know are cannon fodder because they're in a predator movie so you're never given that time to kind of really grow to love them so that they're they're throwaway lines of dialogue that are meant to be funny they're just that so there's no real character depth there that you'd get like with nice guys or kiss kiss bang bang because of how little time you're spending with them. Um, other than that, there's 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 a character all the way through. You're expecting to have a bit of a blowout with the, with the main lead, um, and he gets taken out in a blink, and I missed it. Literally, my eyes were open and I missed it. <laughs> I just, I, I literally blinked, missed it, and then the character's just nowhere to be seen for the rest of the film. I'm like, what the hell happened to that guy? Mm-hmm. And then, like, on the second watch, I didn't blink and I saw a laser just tech him out, and that was it. Like, a real main, like, main character out, out of all the human characters, he was what you would call the main antagonist, and he's just like. Boom, he's gone. I blinked. You don't see it. anyone's reaction to it. You don't. No, no. There's, there's nothing afterwards. No. There's a that he's shot. Yeah. Never referenced again. Yeah. No one reacts. Yeah. It's not like in Equilibrium where you're expecting this massive fight and there's a big build up at the end and then the dude gets taken out like that and it's a gag. It's something that works yeah. as a you know because it's been set up in the right way. Uh, and and it's like boom yeah he's just been taken out and he thought he was a badass. It's just it's literally a, a weird ass shot in which boom gets taken out and I blinked and missed it. Um, so but other than those two aspects, I actually really enjoy the film. I I don't think it's half as bad as people make out. 
I think the ideas that are explored in it are perfectly fine for this kind of movie. Um, is it my least favourite Predator movie outside of AVP? Yeah, but I still enjoy it. I'll still watch it again. I have fun with the action sequences and some of the characters. It's, it is what it is. I enjoy the first hour quite a bit. And I'm going to go out on a limb and say that I buy the group as a bonded set of warriors that that have spent time together and you 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 buy their friendship and you know they have running jokes with each other and this that and the other i i buy just this one element i i buy their camaraderie more than i do the camaraderie in predator uh that's not saying anything about the the movies themselves um i could i can completely agree that the third act is a is a is a clusterfuck um but after reading into it and how apparently it was kind of shane black's matrix resurrection is like all right well this is this is what you want and i'm, I'm just gonna fuck around with things um I, I, the first hour won me over enough that that i actually can put up with the last half you know I, I you know the first hour is good enough where i could just stop it after that and be like all right i've, I've had my fill for the predator and and i i know what happens after that so we, we don't need to talk about that um, a glowing and, recommendation from the man. He put it at number 14. <laughs> um, For CP, it was precisely half as bad as I made it out to be. <laughs> um, and the, 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 the cock tease thing at the end where y you thought it was going to be Arnold. somebody. Arnold. So, yes, it, it was just like, oh, it's still uh, surprising see. to me that we have not had a Predator sequel with Arnold showing up in any fashion. That's still mm. so weird. All right, moving on to 21, we got RoboCop 2. Uh, we were all fairly close, CP being the most forgiving of all of us on this one. Uh, I don't have too much to say about this one. It's a it's a decent enough RoboCop sequel. It's, it's a little bit slightly better than what I expected, being that I don't really hear anybody talk about 2 or 3 ever. Um <clears throat> It's interesting that you have a kid as like the main gangster murderer at, throughout like the second act of the film. Uh, I, I think that there was an idea there for the RoboCop 2 with uh, Tom Noonan, but the way that it was visualized with the computer screen and like the early 90s CG face was a little off for me. I, if they would have had him be half man, half robot, I think I, that's what I was hoping. I was like, that's going to be kind of cool. And it just wasn't quite that for me uh, beyond that. I don't really have much else to say. Uh, Sean, you want to take that one away? I know you're probably a... We're there. <laughs> Whenever yeah, it came out. Right? I mean... <laughs> not quite. A little bit too young for this movie. <laughs> My mom took me to go see RoboCop 2 when I was six years old. Um, <laughs> My dad would have. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's just... Where RoboCop <clears throat> 1 ends this doesn't feel like the natural continuation of the character. And it doesn't feel like they knew what to do with the character because they end the first one with call me Murphy. And this doesn't really continue down that well, they path. Start the movie off kind of like that, where he's actually going to go back and try to interact with his family. And then like 30 minutes into the movie, they never discuss it again. <laughs> right, yeah. And, and that, I think that's kind of the thing. It felt like a movie where they, they had a whole grab bag of ideas mm -hmm. and then they tried to like cobble them together. And it just doesn't really work. There's just like, you could just think through all these different subplots. It's like a series of subplots mashed together, but not really a solid through line. Like, mm -hmm. I feel like you should have had RoboCop 2 come into play 30 minutes earlier in the movie and have <laughs> public like RoboCop 2 not realizing, wait a minute, it's an insane drugged out nuke addict. And then then you have it, but, but it didn't do that. So it's just a very strange script. And it was like dark and cynical without having a right amount of like satirical edge to it i can agree with that any other thoughts or we want to move on well it, the, the, the script for it was actually massive 
Um, it was Frank Miller, Frank Miller's original idea, and a lot of the stuff that kind of got cut from it became all the samurai stuff in RoboCop Three. Um, but uh, yeah, it's uh, for me as someone who was never the biggest original RoboCop fan. We'll get there. I just, I, yeah, I like it. It's not a bad film at all. I like it, but it's just not the classic it's hailed to be. It's not the better than Terminator, as some people have made out recently. Um, not bad. Uh, so it's, it's just, uh, yeah, as, as someone who's just okay with the original film, I felt that this was a pretty decent sequel. Business as usual, but doesn't really go anywhere particularly special. Yep. Agreed. Yeah. To, to what Sean said. All right. Never no, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I'm, I I'm better off not talking. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Number 20 is AVP. Uh, Brian, way, way more down on it than most of us. Uh, everybody else, right there in the middle. Just a movie we could pretty much take or leave. Uh, this came out a year after Freddy vs. Jason, and I was still a young, stupid kid that had no taste. So at one point, I would have told you Alien vs. Predator was my favorite movie. Uh, <laughs> swear to God. Nice. <laughs> I was one of those kids where whatever awesome new movie I watched, I'm like, that's my new favorite. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, it's a movie where like, I, I would be lying if I didn't say that I wish that there was a rated R version of this. It doesn't tank mm. the movie for me, but just like we talked about with Total Recall, we're going to talk about with RoboCop. When you have two rated R, hard R franchises and you put them together and you get PG-13 action, I think you lose a little bit of edge there. But I really like the lore they come up with, with the pyramid hunting ground and all of that. I think that there's some interesting things they do visually with it. Uh, I like the fact that the Predator teams up with the human to take down the queen by the end. I think for an idea that is is as much of a video game movie, literally, as it is a mashing up of two franchises, that it's an entertaining fan fiction version of that story that I can have fun with and I don't expect very much out of it. If I divorce it from both franchises... Mm -hmm. It's like you said, if Freddy vs. Jason, I don't, I don't can really consider them part of either of those timelines. So, you know, just in a fan fictiony what if yeah, type. That's my word. Yeah, that sounds. Yeah, I'll watch this. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna put too much thought into your little. Mm -hmm. uh, it 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 just undoes so many different things if you start thinking about it and. You should not be thinking about it. That that's that's my first thing to tell it's anybody. It's fun when you get somebody that comments and they're like, "Wait, but Alien versus Predator, <laughs> it, it, that movie is contradicting <laughs> Alien versus Predator." And I'm like, "That doesn't count." <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah I mean, it's, it's a fun, stupid excuse to have you know your toys mash into yep. each other. And yep. um, yeah, I I have enough fun with this one. Uh, it's mm -hmm. just very easy to put on. And like every time I watch it, I'm like, "That's not so bad. It's stupid." I'm, I, you know, someone watches it like it should be R. It doesn't. Gotcha, gotcha. I won't defend it. I have fun. Yeah, yeah. You kind of got into it with the with Requiem, Brian, but just not the the the, um, the dialogue and the characters from Paul W S Anderson holds it back quite a bit for you, I imagine. <laughs> and it does, but I like with any Paul W S Anderson film, it, it's it's he's so like average, like he's so strict. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know what to expect with one of his movies and I can have fun with it. Like, n nothing he ever makes is ever going to be considered a classic as far as I'm concerned. But I know it will tick a few boxes that entertain me for the, an hour and a half. Speaking of him, why wasn't Soldier included in this list? That's part of the Blade Runner franchise. Shh. I read it on the internet. Shush. Shush. That's new to me. I don't even want to go down that hole. It's not new to me, but I wanted to stay away from that one because <laughs> reasons. <laughs> there you go. Matrix Reloaded at 19. Uh, Sean and Brian agree, and then me and Charles a little bit more down on it, me being the, the negative Nancy of this one. Uh, <laughs> not a whole lot to add. A couple of cool action sequences. The whole traffic uh, sequence is pretty neat. Beyond that, it's ideas I don't really care for as a continuation of The Matrix uh, CGI all to hell in a way that ages it immediately where you look and you go, ooh, yeah, that's when they haven't figured out CGI yet. 
um, and leaves us off with one of the most terrible, I'll say, cliffhangers ever, where it's just like, I don't care about that. Leaving that theater, and that's why I never saw Matrix Revolutions. What the fuck was that? Uh, anyway, <laughs> see? The Wachowskis heard me. Um, Brian, anything to add? <laughs> I, I just I came out of it, like I said before, thinking that they've got really big ideas and like they're, they're dealing with stuff that most blockbusters won't mm -hmm. even touch on and because of that i had the utmost respect for it uh the the hundred thousand agent smiths in the in the park fight scene just looks dodgy as hell mm -hmm. uh, but the but the rest of it still holds up pretty well um i i, I enjoyed the ending but again that's because i thought they were going places theologically and you know philosophically that smith turning out to be kind of you know just possibly human i thought that was going to be taken much much further than it than it was this idea of smith now being in the human world um and just yeah there was a conversation to be had there um, that could have been, again, quite philosophical, but it ended up being shoot them up instead. So There you go. Anything further, Charles or Sean? I double on what you said, Cody. I think there's some memorable sequences. It's a movie that makes an impact in a way that I don't think Revolution does, or Resurrection does. Like, I, I And had those movies been better i think this one could have been remembered better uh but because those ones dropped the ball so much i think it hurts this one a little bit but th there's memorable stuff here all right moving on to predator 2 uh sean again nailing Woo! the ranking there uh predator 2 me and charles agree and uh sean and brian just a little bit higher on it uh this is i think i even said this in my video this is the most like take it or leave it movie on this list to, me, <laughs> to where there's things about it like take it yeah uh, everything with the predator in the concrete jungle and going after the different gang like that's cool just a, a, a visual standpoint as a contrast from the first movie and, and most of the sequels that's interesting it makes the movie stand out to me um i, I like danny glover of course uh, he's, a, he's a good character by the end of it especially where he's He's kind of a badass taking down the Predator himself hand to hand. But uh, everything else, the ultra 90s, like generic cop storyline, some of the CGI, like I, I say it. it all the time. Love it. There you go. I say it all the time <laughs> that like 80s nostalgia is so in and is so like uh, it, it's a thing that we praise. 90s nostalgia hasn't gotten there yet. Like 90s has this weird thing about it. And this is a very 90s movie. So, yeah, it, it's. It's fine. That's as far as I can go with it. It just feels like Lethal Weapon 2.5, except with a Predator thrown into it. I mean, half the cast is from the <laughs> Lethal Weapon movies. <laughs> and even think like these small little parts, like the captain and everything. Oh, it's the captain from Lethal Weapon. It's like so many familiar faces from those movies. And then it's even like a detective mystery that doesn't work because the audience... Well, we saw Predator before we saw Predator Two, so we yeah. know what you're hunting. So it, it the 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 format, the story doesn't work because the mystery, we already know the answer to it. So it, it it's watchable. There's some cool stuff in there, but overall, it just is a very generic cop thriller with a predator thrown in. Yeah, it, it took the words out of my mouth. They they don't follow format when it comes to a sequel. Like we we know we know what we're here for. And if you just put that movie in without knowing what's on, you have no clue you're watching a Predator movie for at least half an hour. You're like, oh, this is a really bizarre <laughs> Los Angeles riot movie. Crazy. There you go. All right. Uh, actually surprised how high this one made it up, but 17, we got the Robocop remake. Um, again, Oops. Charles does not like these remakes at all. Uh, the rest of us are pretty in line. Uh, pretty much copy and paste what I said about Total Recall, but more enthusiastically, I think Robocop is the better of the two. Yeah. Um, I, I think that uh, maybe it's a hot take. It's it's kind of going along with what Brian said. Mm -hmm. I actually really like uh, the, the new 
uh, Robocop. Damn, his name is escaping me right Joel now. Uh, yes, yes, Joel mm. Kinnaman. I, I just like him as an actor ever since I saw him in The Killing. Yep. Uh, so I, I really enjoy his new take. I think that he gets a lot more emotional to do than Peter Weller ever did, and he still his is... family matters. Yeah, and he's still able to emote as a human even after he has been turned into Robocop. He's not robotic. you know. He's not like that type of version of the character. And there's parts of me that prefer that. Um, I think that just because the, the direction of the movie, too, I think that even though it's not stellar action, I think the action is a bit more satisfying in this one. Uh, and I like the fact that they hold on to the heart of Robocop, and what that movie was going for, but they modernized the commentary on it to where now it's about drone warfare and do we need to have somebody with a conscious behind the gun and things like that. And so I think that they do a really good job at doing a modern version of it. Where the flaws come into me is basically all the third act, where it feels yep. like there's like 20 minutes missing mm -hmm. from the story yep. to where the mystery of who killed Alex Murphy, the villainous nature that we don't even really explore that much with michael keaton's character it's not really intertwined in a way that makes sense for the third act and so we just get an answer for okay the chief is corrupt and then now michael keaton is the big villain when he was never really villainous throughout the movie uh and so the third act is where it's just like well that kind of went off the rails a bit um but i have a lot of fun with it yeah i mean i think what you said about total recall um I think very much applies here of mm -hmm. if you, you, if you're not comparing it to the Paul Verhoeven movie, it works a lot better save for what you just said about the third act feeling like, did, did you guys film a two and a half hour long movie and trim it down to two hours? Like what, what happened here? Cause that was very abrupt, mm -hmm. but I mean, they do new stuff with it. The tech is different. The commentary is different. That's what you're supposed to do. But when you have like Paul Verhoeven has such a distinct flavor and style mm -hmm. and it's impossible to not have those comparisons when you're remaking something. So I get why a lot of people wrote it off. I think it has a lot more to offer than people give it credit for. Mm -hmm. and and every time, every time I rewatch it, I'm like, yeah, this, this thing works. Mm -hmm. I, Brian, prefer get it it. <laughs> I prefer it to the original. Uh, I just, Hey, Cody, where's the, can you eject? Um, <laughs> someone from the... <laughs> the the family matters this is yeah. the thing the family is so integral to the story of who this man is you know like the, the you look at the original film and the the family's dropped but actually that's that's the that's his one tie to humanity that's the thing that keeps him human his the the having that foot in in the fact you know in that world in the fact that his family still exists and it's just abandoned in the original really it's just it's not it's a non-event because they're too yeah they just want to have shoot them ups with villains and make social commentary about me just well that's great but without the heart of a of a real character driven story it doesn't mean much to me whereas in this one the family is integral from start to finish it's it's them that kind of give us the the exploration of this guy's humanity versus the machine parts. Um, I, I just think it's, yeah, a much better character driven story for me. Yeah. Uh, all of the credit I, I give this movie is like I said, in my review, I, I didn't know his name was Alex Murphy until I saw the remake. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you get a lot more, uh, about the character and 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 his interests and his family, like you say. But uh, again, if you if you title this "Corpse Drone Man," uh, I like that I, too. <laughs> I have it on a on a much higher level. But coming off of RoboCop on uh, on the on the biting satire and and the commentary, it, it this is doesn't do that at at really all so it just again it, it's 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 hard for me to not think of Verhoeven when I when I watch this movie again title it something else and 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 I'll, I'll talk about it in a cop different robot. way <laughs> cop robot cop <laughs> robot change one letter <laughs> 
So this is funny. Uh, I posted the the stream to Facebook and Twitter when we went live, and apparently because I was doing clips in between all of that, the link that I posted was to that Billy Madison clip of him saying, this is a nice piece of shit, and so everybody <laughs> clicked on it from Facebook and Twitter. That's all they got. So the new... The, my, the correct... my, my wife texted me like, hey, I tried to watch the video, and all I got was Billy Madison. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, yeah. Wait, wait, it's self-roast. There you go. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Desi, for uh, messaging me that. I wish I had seen that an hour and 25 minutes ago. But nonetheless, good laugh. Alien Covenant. So you've got 16 here. Again, pretty big disparity. Me and Sean pretty close there. And then uh, Brian and CP much more forgiving on it. Uh, and, and <laughs> We're this... eight apart! <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. Uh, I'm three above you. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> okay, fine, fine, fine. <laughs> this belongs there. All right, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, so Alien Covenant, uh, I mean, we're kind of going to bleed into the next one, too. So I mean, we might as well just click the next one as well, because it's the same conversation, really, 15, although the numbers are much more, much more disparity Woo! there to where, yeah, 4 and 11 and 22 Number and 26. Four. You are smoking crack. Yeah. I'm telling you. So there we go. You got yeah, these two movies. Eight is... <laughs> For me, you can kind of copy and paste both my statements from both movies. Uh, you have Ridley Scott, sci-fi spectacle, talking about life and creation and the relationship between creator and the creation and all of that. And then you have Alien prequel. And I know Brian's going to disagree heavily, and I'm pretty sure CP will as well. I don't feel like those two concepts mesh together very well in these two movies, and I am very much there for this one, which is the one that gets shortchanged in both of them. Uh, so Prometheus, gorgeous-looking film, interesting ideas, well-cast, um, not quite the Alien prequel that I was hoping for or wanted when they advertised it as such. Alien Covenant. The trailer ruins it for for anybody expecting alien stuff. Yeah, Alien Covenant, uh, they very much marketed it towards the alien mm -hmm. fans as like, okay, guys, this is the movie this time, and even that one is not really the movie that they were trying to advertise it as. It's more of that, which is why I have it slightly higher. But um, as much as I would want to see the cl concluding chapter just so this story actually gets its end, these are just not movies that work for me that are that are appealing to me I, I have a problem with people acting like those concepts that you say don't mesh together didn't exist in the very first alien film because everything to do with the character of ash is exactly what ridley scott is further exploring with the I character of david and ai he's <laughs> done more subtly perhaps but that too no no it's kind of matters that, <laughs> Subtlety matters. No, it. I feel like the his his. It's not, it's not that it's like uh, oh I'm hitting you over the head with this. It's just he's exploring that side of things more than he was the other side of things. Uh, it's just he's he's exploring the other side of that coin. And to me, it's he's, he's always had a fascination with AI and where we're heading with it. Um, and I just I just feel like. I personally feel like they mesh together well. I don't. They don't. They don't seem odd to me. Um, I I love the exploration of this Nietzschean idea that you know the creator wants to kill the created and thereby supplant. Uh, sorry, the, the 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 created wants to kill the creator and thereby supplant um, his creator. Um, become the, the the creator so to speak i i think it's explored really well and i think david is one of the most fascinating characters he's the best that part i will in, say that in cinema yeah just i just in the last 20 years of cinema he's one of the most fascinating characters for me that i, I would really love to see a conclusion to that story well, yeah, yeah i i just thought i mean echo much of what what cody said and um Adding to that, I mean, part of what is enjoyable about the original Alien is that there's a very simple, straightforward, like, life cycle, simple, straightforward plot, and you get to Prometheus, and 
there's the goo and then there's the the zombie guy that shows up and there's all these different moving parts and like i think the i know how that scene and the then the scene scene. That and, yeah. and pretty... then it, and then it, the next movie it's spores and it's it like it just it some of just even like following along with how does this thing birth it can't even track along with it and i don't even know how some of it factors in um and then we're musing about gods and creations way too much as i just it was just too much and uh the stuff that i liked in alien covenant is just kind of copying stuff that i liked about alien and aliens so i just to me um they they just don't they don't work and i I would have much preferred sure go off and do your own thing don't tie it to the aliens just do your your sci-fi movie that's filled with philosophical ideas that are very heavy-handed go do that but the, this isn't the origin story that I want for Xenomorphs at all. And this is the, well, not trilogy that we know of, but this is the series of movies that uh, effectively killed the Neil Blomkamp alien direct sequel that I so desperately wanted to see as well. So there's always going to be that little bit of a, from me. <laughs> I, I don't disagree with you there. I, I certainly wanted Neil Blomkamp's sequel. Um, but I do think... Prometheus is it's not it's not you know it, it's 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 Mandalorian for the alien franchise it it's it's in the same universe yes and this is not the way it's just <laughs> it just the fact that they fucking Fox the fact that they had to throw that that last 15 seconds in kind of changes everything about you know everybody's expectations and, and whatever for for prometheus but i i enjoyed all all of the the heavy-handed you know what is life and and uh, religious concepts and and you know somebody who is a scientist who's still actually quite religious um and the the back and forth that almost everybody has with with david nope yeah david's character um and uh i i i got quite a kick out of when uh wieland is that uh, wayland wyland wayland scott wyland when scott wyland was uh <laughs> uh when he when he's dying and he's just like hi cody <laughs> i offended him <laughs> out of here <laughs> uh when he when he dies and he goes there's nothing and and david says yes i know and it's just like mm, okay that that that's that's pretty neat because he he gets talked down to so much as the android and you know you're just a robot what, what, what would you know i mean even one of the last lines is uh what he, he says why do you want to go uh whatever and she says i don't know so he asks her why why she misses something or why why and her her response is well you, because i'm a human and you're a robot and it uh alien covenant um takes what people liked about prometheus and what people want about alien and then says how about a little bit of both and fuck both of them because we don't care about either side we just want to make movies there we go moving on to number 13 predators so we've got uh, we're all pretty close on this one brian not quite as favorable but uh this is a sequel that it grows on me every time i watch it first time i saw it um i was fine with it but it wasn't really it was like yeah well, that's that's not quite predator level for me it's fine and every time I rewatch it, I appreciate it more and more. Mm-hmm. I like the cast. I like the the variety of characters that we get here and the variety of personalities. Uh, I think that this is the only Predator sequel that tries to introduce like new lore and new concepts that actually does it well and doesn't bog down the movie to where you got different factions of Predators and this planet that's a hunting ground and they're feuding. And uh, really the only... The only major negative that I ever have with this movie that is still there, even when I rewatched it a couple weeks ago, is that I just don't think that the uh, the Adrian Brody character it was either written 
correctly for that actor or the it was miscast because for him to be kind of a replacement for the Arnold character to where even where he's kind of talking in a Christian Bale voice like come on kill me like it just it doesn't come across right for me uh it doesn't derail the movie at any point but it just it feels like it should have been a different type of character or they should have got somebody that makes sense for that type of role which Adrian Brody is not despite how great of an actor he is but I I really enjoy this one as far as Predator sequels go it's pretty damn fun and for as much as I love one that we're going to be talking about here soon. Um, it, it was a close call on my ranking of which one I preferred. I mean, it's safe, mm -hmm. but it's it's that safe doesn't mean bad. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. It's like if you're going to kind of kind of rehash people battling predator in the jungle, it has a fun enough little twist on it of getting the best predators from Earth and putting them on this hunting ground. Like that's all. Like yeah, I I want to see a predator movie like that, and we mm -hmm. got one. And the cast. Um, I mean, I can understand why Adrian Brody doesn't work, and I think in the past he bugged me when I rewatched it this time. I, I didn't mind him at all, mm. but like, there's some fun stuff. Like, you know, Topher Grace is like this creepy guy, and um, <laughs> Walton <just> like, Goggins. <laughs> Walton Goggins is amazing. <laughs> I mean, just they, their little banter between each, the two of them, like. Yeah, they're just amazing. <laughs> I just love that whole line that he has. Where I hope it doesn't demonetize this. Where he's just like, "Yeah, I can't wait to get out of here and just be raping bitches." And he's like, "What?" And he's just like, "Gonna be a raping bitch by the clock." Like, yeah, 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 raping bitches time. And he's just like, "Yeah, you rape those bitches, whatever." <laughs> so, is it a groundbreaking, super witty, clever predator? No, but it does it deliver the stuff I want. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. And when and when people say like they don't like this one. I don't understand. If you, if you say it's generic, safe, sure. But when you say you just don't like it, like I don't. What, what did you want from a Predator movie? Yeah, it, it's it's just an inverse to Predator. You, you know, it it's it's his planet or their planet, and they brought the the prey to them. Um, uh, m my favorite, perhaps most haunting scene in that movie is when they have. Johnny twenty three as bait. Oh, it, help me! Mm -hmm. It was it was creepy, and it, and, yeah. and surround sound. You're like, what? I'd, I'm actually very afraid right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and a samurai. I, I love seeing a samurai mm -hmm. go up against a predator. Mm -hmm. It that's makes me want to see a. Uh, uh, yeah, that's the biggest yeah. idea I've seen people tossing around since Prey come out. Is that they'll show a Feudal samurai Japan. and they're like, yeah, yeah, do one in that era now. Yeah, which I would love yeah. to see. <clears throat> They'd call me Johnny 500, but they knew the truth. Yep. There you go. All right. <laughs> on air references for anyone <laughs> yeah. trying to catch up on the conversation. <laughs> there you go. Oh, okay. This one. Guns a-blazing, boys. Here we go. Number 12. Time Cop. I mean, RoboCop. <laughs> 7, 7, 11, and 23. <laughs> How dare you? How dare you? 12. <laughs> Brian, you start. <laughs> oh, it's not a bad film. I'm not saying it's a bad film. It's a good film. I've got nostalgia for it. Uh, a lot of memories going back to my childhood when a certain friend of mine was like proper banging on about it and made me watch it. And I thought, yeah, it's good. I remember the violence. I remember the reaction to the violence from parents and people at school and stuff. And I'm just like, all right, it's a good film. Yeah. Uh, but. Is it as good as the Terminator? No. <laughs> I, I, I just, no. We're not. I, we're not making that argument, though. Yeah, no. But somebody did recently. No, no. Somebody, right, but you know, <laughs> uh, you have it against thirty movies. Yeah, and you're talking and this about this is Terminator. where I put it. Yeah, and this is where I put it. Is is it as good as the Matrix? No. Is it as good as Predator? No. Is it as good as Alien and Aliens? No. Is it as good as Terminator 2? No. It's we all just... agree with that, but it's the 10 between 20 and 10. <laughs> those are the ones where we're like, wait a minute, wait a minute, you have it behind all those other movies. Mm -hmm. I do, yeah. Because because it's it's just, I watch it now, and it's just it just feels very dated to me. It feels quite corny. I feel like the music at times is really intrusive and doesn't quite match. Really what, awesome. What? No, it 
doesn't match what's playing out on screen. You have sometimes you've got this really triumphant music to a scene that's like should actually maybe be a bit more somber. It's, satire. A bit, it's just no, it's stupid. How, well, it how do you feel that, about Starship no, because Troopers? Because those, those scenes at Starship Troopers is great, but those scenes uh, are about the satire. I don't understand what you're talking about. I, I genuinely don't understand what you're talking about. I never it's, understand it's done what you're same... talking about. No, it's not. Ah, it's nor not. do I. It's done, it's done with more <laughs> skill. It's done with more skill. I feel like the, the score in this is just, it's it's not great when it, it's, it's matched up to the particular scenes that it's played with. It is um, the same approach as Starship Troopers. Yeah, but it's done better in Starship Troopers. It, it's got that same rah-rah, you know satire yeah, where... which fits with a military based movie that is is likened to the american kind of spirit with regards to how it invades countries and this that and the other it doesn't work when you've got scenes in a police station that don't require triumphant music and yet it's just bombarded with it it's you look at it <laughs> CP. It's got it's it's got the same approach. It's it, it it's like yes, the same it's blueprint. The, just dude, just because something has the same approach doesn't mean it's done as well as another film does it. Terminator three has the same approach as Terminator and Terminator well, you're, you're Two. Saying it doesn't that, mean that's, a good point. That's I want good. to move Terminator three up on my list now. Mm. You you're, you're talking you, about your like argument the, doesn't no your, your argument doesn't wash i haven't you're i haven't set. made an argument you, you you're talking made an argument you're, you're talking making, about you're, music uh, yeah. ruining a you're, scene uh, yes and I'm talking it's, about it's music played for satirical no, effect no it's not no it's not yes you it know, is no, it's, in every single scene in every single scene yeah of yeah, Robocop, you, every every single scene, you, every you, single every single scene. You watch so the, the music, straight. the music in every single scene is played for satirical. You effect, watch Robocop it? straight. What, you, every you, single you, scene, every single scene, start to finish. You no, watch listen, Robocop no, straight. Listen, listen. When you make when you do music to a film, right? You've got to. You're supposed to pull certain emotions out of the audience, not. Every single scene in RoboCop is built for satirical nature, okay? There are stuff in there that is, is genuinely about character like development. There are scenes in there. Right now. There Every are scenes in scene. there. Yeah. It, it, so t t to simply say, no, that the, 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 the whole score is meant to be satirical is the most bollocks statement that anybody could make about <laughs> music in a film. It's just because it's not. Music does a whole host of things that should bring out different emotions and experiences throughout the whole film. And not the whole the whole of that film isn't satirical. Lots of it is satirical. So to just play the same kind of triumphant music, whatever the scene, does not make the, sense. The triumphant so, music is is during like Robocop the and the Brian's police. Gonna be this. <laughs> <laughs> no, there, there are scenes, there are scenes in that film that as I was watching it, I was sat there thinking, this music isn't the appropriate music to have during this scene. And it had nothing to do with whether or not it was satirical in nature. It was just badly scored. What, which, My opinion. Do you have a reference? What, what, what scene? Right right now, no, because I the watched one at the, the film. The <laughs> <laughs> you know, Every in Detroit. <laughs> so we clearly disagree on the music. Uh, we so clearly <laughs> disagree on the music. Onto the other elements it's just of Robocop. Like, man alive. <laughs> Robocop onto the other, uh, onto the other elements of Robocop, like the numerous arguments I've made about flipping. Oh, well, we just need a guy to do this in a suit. But no, apparently he went to acting school for a very special class to teach you how to do how to move Ryan, like have you a seen robot the behind the scenes footage where <laughs> <laughs> there can be only one and his name is peter weller no um so mm. robocop to me this is a movie that the character of robocop has always been cooler than the movie uh yeah. like i remember my dad taking me uh to get the robocop toy from kmart or some shit and it was like you know a foot tie and the leg would pop out in the gun i thought it was the coolest thing ever but the movie itself has never had like the staying power in my conscience as movies like terminator alien some of the other franchises we're talking about so 
uh, it's one that every time I revisit it, I'm like, yeah, I really enjoy this. This is a lot of fun. This is cool. The violence is out, you know, insane. And uh, there's just the right amount of Verhoeven weirdness to where I always end up liking it on rewatch more than I remember. And then it's a movie that kind of fades out of my, my memory a bit to where Terminator, Alien, Matrix, all of that are like always there. But RoboCop, for some reason, never really penetrates into like my my heart, my soul, I guess. I don't know. But it just it I think it's a lot of fun. Um, I, I'm, a, I'm a sucker for that 80s Verhoeven style. Um, I, I agree with Brian on the Peter Weller thing, although I, I like what they do. I think that he he works for what they want him for in this movie. I've never understood the, you know, there can be only one. I compared it to Robert Anglin. Like, it's not a Robert Anglin Freddy situation to me. But, uh, hey, what? I want one. Delivery service. But, um, but yeah, I, I like the movie a lot. Um, it's, for, for even a movie in the 80s, it's kind of shocking for how bloody and just unrelenting it is. I mean, just, just watching Peter Weller get just decimated with shotgun blasts in that scene, it's just like, they're still shooting him and parts are just blowing off. Can't hear you, Sean. And they're laughing. Like yeah. that's the part that makes it like so dark is that they're like hysterically laughing as the guy's like, ah! yeah. <laughs> exactly. So yeah, I, I have a lot of fun with it. Uh, being the fact that I rewatched it, um, we'll see if it. Pen- <laughs> Someone says RoboCop didn't penetrate Cody. Yeah, we'll see if it <laughs> penetrates me this time around. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, uh, I, I'm a lot more of the camp that has fun with this um despite agreeing that it's not on the caliber of the what yeah. seven or I, eight films i have above it i have fun with it i have fun with it it's a good mm-hmm. film it's just not a classic that people make it out to be mm-hmm. i love you brian love you too no bad see we can we can <laughs> we're, we're okay not we're since right. friday the 13th part five have we had a brian and, and cp blowout of that caliber so that was <laughs> awesome all right sean continue yeah. to yeah. redeem brian's 23 um on robocop yes yes <laughs> i mean it's just like just paul verhoven in his prime with his dark satirical sense of humor his ultra violence and uh, a story that it, it's so dehumanized in so much of what's happening. Therefore, when you have this character slowly regaining his humanity and the society losing its humanity, it, it even managed to be, have like emotional swell as you get to the end. He says, call me Murphy. And then the credits roll. And that victorious, triumphant music plays at the police station. And it's incredible. <laughs> Uh, a tear is coming to my eye even as I say this. That's because my contact is irritating my eye. But even as I say this, a tear comes to my eye because of that amazing, amazing music. Would you? Wouldn't you agree, Brian? No, <laughs> <laughs> not at all. <clears throat> I I would say that there is not a right lot in there to connect me to this guy's humanity because one, had had they done He's something the like. Robot? Uh, yeah, had they done something like maybe, I don't know, show us his family and the ties to his family and the relationship with his family. and They how do that in two, which is, which is I thought, weird. For a minute. <laughs> yeah, where for, he yeah, stalks for, for his like ex-wife minute, or whatever. One minute. It's so strange. Yeah, there's, there's, there's nothing there, really, for me to root for this guy. Uh, I, I just I don't care about the character because they don't really give me much reason to care about him. But. Yeah, I I, I, w- I wouldn't call RoboCop a, 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 a protagonist, so to speak. It, it's more about how corrupt and just in it for the money the the police are, or, or the corporation. Corporation, yeah. Yeah, is and it it it, it kind of is a commentary on uh, you know something shouldn't shouldn't be for profit, America. <laughs> <laughs> all right let's keep these uh this passion going with something that i'm very excited made this high the fact that it's over robocop kind of is shocking to me but uh i'm all for it terminator dark fate Woo. at 11 and Oops. um yeah yeah could have been even higher if it wasn't for uh <laughs> the internet personified over here in 17 <laughs> okay uh like 
despite how comedic I tried to go over the top in my uh, 31 video that some people kind of misconstrued. If you don't like this movie, but you actually watched it and gave it a chance, totally fair. But this is one of those movies that I will always hate the internet for because there was this anti-woke backlash against it and all these things where there was like this much of the plot was leaked regarding the fate of a character in the first two minutes that people colored the rest of the film with that and so the fans literally killed this movie and killed any potential of sequels and I, I've seen many more people that actually finally watch it and give it a shot actually like it than I have those that watch it and say yep it's exactly what I thought it was going to be yeah. To me, this is the only sequel, while still not being anywhere near the caliber of the first two films, but 99.9% .9 of films aren't. This is the only sequel that I think is actually a worthy narrative follow-up to the first two films. Um, a lot of people try to throw out the, uh, the hypocrite card about my disdain for the first few minutes of Alien 3 as opposed to my support of the first few minutes of this. And I think it's apples and oranges. You have one movie where they kill off these characters unceremoniously and actually destroy the narratives that were built in the previous film to where this one, I understand the, the knee jerk. I understand the knee jerk reaction, but when they kill off John Connor, the victory of getting rid of Skynet is still there. And then they reframe the importance of Sarah Connor, who to me was always the more interesting character anyway. For, for as much as John Connor continuously was the focus of all of these sequels, they never quite got it right after the second film. And they well, always tried to mm -hmm. dismiss and forget the importance of Sarah in those first two movies, which yeah. anytime anybody talks about Terminator, they always talk about <laughs> their favorite characters. And Sarah Connor is almost always mentioned when I never hear anybody talk about John Connor, despite the fact that he's you know, the central figure of the the franchise. So I actually think there's a lot more narratively going on with what's up. Uh, we skipped number 14, which was probably Terminator salvation. Oh, CP. What? Do I have number 14? I do. I, Whoops, I double checked. Bad. I asked that's you. my bad. That's my bad guys. Okay. Let me, uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about dark fate and I'll go back. Cause I, I, I uploaded all of them at once and it for some reason, skip number 14. But anyway, I don't want to go on forever about it. To me, I see the opening of this movie completely differently than the people that try to compare it to Alien 3. And, once and you I get, get where that, they're coming from. I like do, if, too, if, to an like extent. I, I can see why people say, oh, you're a hypocrite, or what about... like If you take it that way, I can understand because I feel that way about Alien 3 and I can't get past it. So mm -hmm. if you can't get past it, I can relate from that other movie. I just see it totally differently same yeah exactly so it, i can respect if somebody sees it that way i just i don't i don't appreciate the hypocrite card because i'm like well that's just not how i see it i think there's more going on in the story than than what was going on in alien 3 where they just literally like well we can't get these characters back so fuck them uh so you have from then on this similar setup to the first two terminator films but to me they advance it all in a way that's interesting you get mackenzie davis who is the kyle reese character but she's actually like modified to be almost half machine which i thought was a really interesting new detail to me this is the only movie that found a way to actually advance past the t-1000 in a way that made sense where you have now an endoskeleton and the t-1000 within one being i thought that was awesome uh, i really enjoy the way that they incorporate Arnold Schwarzenegger into this. You know, people like to make fun of the fact that he's named Carl, but the little bit oh. of development that we get in T2 to where he's learning mm. from his experiences with humans in the couple of days that that film takes place, you extrapolate that by 30 years. To me, that makes sense that he's going to incorporate himself and going to, you know, he's fulfilled, fulfilled his purpose and now he has no purpose. It, I find it to be a little bit more profound than some texts people. texts every now and again. Yeah, he's and he, got you know, purpose. He, he's a hell of a drape guy too. Uh, but uh, <laughs> the action sequences, I think, are really good. It gets a little over the top with the airplane sequence, mm. but it's this is a movie that I'm just always going to be on the opposite end of the earth with some people, and uh, it's because most of the arguments I hear against it, as Brian ranted on earlier, don't hold a lot of water for me, and don't make sense. And to throw out that word seems hypocritical when I see the same people praising other films for the same exact thing that isn't done quite as well in this one to me. So 
a hill that I will die on. Sean, I know you agreed because me and you were like worried. We, we both saw it and we're like, so did you like it? Are we, are we okay, good. So two of us liked it on planet Earth. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, uh, I um, <laughs> repeat most everything you said. And just th- I think there's a number of things they're able to do with it that uh, emphasizes how important Sarah Connor really was. And um, and it doesn't undo the end of Terminator 2. It just reframes your understanding of what really took place. And through going and saving Sarah and stopping her from killing Miles Dyson throughout all the, the way that that played out, he, he fulfilled his purpose just in a different in a different time. Yeah. And, and that's and I, really I, interesting. And I don't find it to be a waste either. Where, where For some people, they see it as a waste. Okay, well, then he didn't stop shit if it's just going to happen again in this other timeline. Well, that's the nature of war, is it not? Yeah. I mean, we yeah. win war, World War One. Well, World War Two comes eventually. Eventually, there'll be you know, World War Three. Like, it's just... John Connor uh, stopped World War One. <sighs> yeah. Way to air back, CP. Way to <laughs> air back. Continue your airbag. <laughs> intelligent. Get, get, your thought, get your thoughts out on this one, CP, because I'm going to let Brian end it because I know he's been... I. I told him to put the lid on the jar, and the jar is going to implode. I wish the the I'm 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 kind of in the Alien Three camp. I I I wish they would just stretch it a little bit. They had time to. You, you could have had John and and Sarah on the run for a little bit, even if it's just ten minutes. Uh, I would have appreciated that. Um, and the third act is a bit. All right. Is is everything indestructible? Um, so that that's why uh, it, it's it's so low for me. But uh, I, I I do. You, you just brought it up, Cody. I, I do like the fact that all right. If you altered the future in one movie, then why not have it be somebody else that has to save the day? Because now we've we've changed everything, so it it can be whoever in the next sequel. I don't know why it took them three movies to try that idea, but I, I, I don't hate it. I, I certainly don't hate it. From this point on, on my list, I was kind of three stars or better, I think. Mr. Lomax? Yeah, the, the problem isn't that they get rid of John Connor in the way that they do. The problem is that they didn't do it sooner. Like this should have been done in Terminator Three, um, and, and again, I don't have a problem with it because he still fulfilled his purpose. He still fulfilled his destiny. He stopped Judgment Day, uh, his Judgment Day, his version of Judgment Day. It's just that that morphed into something else and has now become someone else's Judgment Day, um, which, like you know, like you say. If you, alter history if you alter timelines then things move things stop around but it doesn't necessarily mean you completely stop stuff but for me terminator has always been primarily sarah connor's story john Mm. connor isn't even in the original film it's like you know and and when you go to to terminator 2 once again it's 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 really Sarah Connor's story, like where you know what she, what she, where she been, what she had to put up with as a mother, what she's had to go through, the sacrifices she's had to make, the sacrifices she's going to, she's going to continue to make. Uh, will she lose her humanity in the uh, sake of stopping machines from destroying humanity? It's just to me, she's always been the most fascinating character. And what this film does is it, is it says, okay, well, once you lose your son, do you stop? being a mother and the answer in the case of sarah connor is no because she she's that's who she is and even when her son is gone she transplants that mothering instinct reluctantly at first to someone else because that's her destiny that's her purpose in life um and it whether that's to john connor or someone else that's who she will always be ultimately and that's what the film's saying i think it's great does a great job of it I like the slap in the face moment too, where Sarah thinks that she's protecting the next mother of the the, the guy who's going to save the day, and it's no, no, you're protecting mm. the woman who's going to save the day. Which some of the internet has ruined that aspect of the movie, but uh, I thought it was a a neat little oh yeah. oh 
I'm an idiot. I, I didn't realize that that was possible. Yeah. And I think like the the stuff with Carl as well is like, yeah, if you if you, if you send a Terminator back and they can't self terminate and they complete the mission, what the hell did they do? <laughs> like. <laughs> If they do carpentry or uh, exactly they've got, <laughs> they've got to do something and we've established we've established in terminator 2 that they're out they're a learning machine so it makes sense that they would have to find a purpose they would have to become more human they marry uh, widows yeah mm. even, even if it's a <laughs> even if it's a facsimile of humanity you know even if he never has a soul and it's never truly human it's it's still it makes sense to me. I, I just, I do, yeah, I don't get a lot of the arguments. I think we live in an age where people just think that tearing something down somehow proves that they're on a higher intellectual plane, rather than just actually appreciating things that you know, and, and sharing why they appreciate something. I think it Let, completes the, the a lot of the arc that was started in T2 as well to where the T800 was very much the father figure for John, but he just didn't have enough time to quite get there. Like, mm, John yeah. got there, yeah. and when he gets to the end, you know, I know now why you cry, and he's just starting to yeah. understand. And then you get into three, and he spends these 30 years protecting this woman and her son and, and being the surrogate father to where, as he learns, he continues to understand that parental bond, and that's why he takes pity on on sarah connor and starts to give her purpose because he's yeah. lost his and you know you know for john and by the end sacrifices to to, to make up for what he did like I, I just think there's so many ideas in this movie narrative wise that just they're I on the they're on the exploration of themes and everything that the first two films were and it just it, i hate the fact that it all just gets tossed away because well, they killed john connor fuck this movie yeah. it's like that's oh, okay I've, I've been watching recently the, the the sarah connor chronicles uh and there's there's an interesting moment in one episode where one character remembers something happening and another character doesn't but the character who remembers it says you were there and the character who doesn't remember it says i wasn't there oh Basically, says I wasn't there, and it's like, and they suddenly realize something's been changed. So, so some something has been changed. There's our spots have been changed. Yeah, yeah. No, no. So, <laughs> it, it, so a ter a Terminator must have gone back in time, done something. Mm -hmm. It's created a change, which is why you remember something happening. But it's no longer in my timeline, and I just thought that was an interesting point because it makes you think about the first film. You know, it's there's the whole thing: which came first, the chicken or the egg? Which came first, the the the, the Terminator in the crusher, or the the, the time travel? You know, it's that timeline pa time travel paradox. Mm -hmm. But what you have to get to is the notion that actually the first Terminator film isn't actually the first Terminator film. It is yeah. the end. It's the end result of multiple things that happened that then led to that moment. History played out multiple times before that moment was reached. Can Can you highlight that resident doctor? Evil? I was waiting for because I want Brian just to exclusively uh, I, respond I, I, to it. I, oh, I, you too. You go ahead. Yeah, that that movie is Sarah's story. She needs to live. It, she's completely relevant. That movie is about her. Well, that's what I like about this one is that it reframes the importance of her because no. you can watch the first two films as it's all a means to the John Connor end. John is one. only John because right. of Sarah Connor. Exactly. Okay. She trained him. She made sure he was checking his back every single day of his life. She got him paranoid enough to, you know, to, to, to like keep looking over his shoulder well, and do well, the work. Not in the first becoming, film, but not yeah. in the first film, but in the second film. That that, right. that time between the first film and the and where we find John at the second film, we're, we're filled in with that with dialogue. We know that John is the way he is because his mother constantly indoctrinated him from birth that you are the future leader of humanity you need to keep yourself safe you need to not be hooked into things that 
you can be tracked with. You need to learn about computers because it's going to be very important for you in the future to have to deal with Terminators. So he is John Connor because of her. It's like without her, that's it. It's over. Game over. It's done. It's like yeah. it, it, that argument to me just just seems. I don't know. I I I, I can't get my head around that. It's yeah. it's ridiculous. Yeah, if Sarah Connor dies. There is no John. But yeah, that's. And yeah. But like I was saying, where he's she's saying he's only relevant because of John. But that's what I like about Dark Fate is that it makes it to where no, she's relevant even despite John. Mm. Because yeah. now John is gone, yeah. and now she is still going yeah. to play that role, that mother, that yeah. trainer, that yeah. that protector for somebody else to prevent yeah. another future yeah. war. So Who, Skynet, whoever, yeah. yeah, whoever the leader of the human resistance is, they are so because of Sarah Connor, and that's the point. That you look at Dark Fate and it's like, no, she is the point. She is the reason that a, a, a resistance leader exists. Mm -hmm. She was with John and she will be with the next one when John was taken out of the picture. There you go. Any more thoughts on Dark Fate? I'm thinking we're on that one the longest, which I love. Let me talk a little. <laughs> <laughs> All right, moving 14. on to number two. 14. Yes, 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 yes. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, my bad, guys. So 14 was Terminator Salvation. Uh, again, Sean and then Brian getting a bit of that correct action. Um, we're all pretty close on that one, too. So this is a movie that um, I understand some of the shortcomings of it. I think this one, is this one PG-13? Yeah. I'm certain that it is. So it's, is it? it? Yeah, oh. it, it's the only one, I think. Maybe Genesis is, too. But it, it, it loses a slight amount of that edge. But I like the fact that this movie, because of the time travel paradox, is like both a prequel and a sequel in the same sense because of the placement of the timeline. Um, I really like the cast in this one. I think that of the John Connors, obviously Christian Bale is the best of the, the ones that we've gotten outside of T2. Um, I really like the fact that we get to see the future war and we get subtle references to things from the movies, like where... Um, you get Sam Worthington showing some of Kyle Reese some of the things that he does in the first film, where it doesn't feel like the movie comes to a screeching halt and it's like fan service moment. It like it makes sense within the story. Um, I like Anton Yelchin, rest in peace, in the, uh, the role of Kyle Reese. I think that he he does what Nick Stahl couldn't, to where he doesn't look physically like this is Kyle Reese, but he has the attitude. Um, and, and I think that there's some interesting new Terminator designs that we get. Again, with Terminator Genesis, why the hell they decided to spoil the fact that Sam Worthington was a Terminator in the marketing <laughs> is beyond me because that's such a huge pivotal moment in the movie. Um, but I really like his character, too. The fact that a Terminator is part of the reason why John Connor is able to save humanity and continue on. And so this is another one of those Terminator movies, uh, not quite as passionately as Dark Fate, but to where I don't understand a lot of the hate for it because despite the fact right. that it's not a typical terminator story i think it works very well in the franchise yeah i i love the complaints that it's, it's too it's too dark it's too gritty mick g directed it uh he, he made charlie's angels which is bright and obnoxious as hell uh it's the end of the world guys like that uh, it's it's the way it's supposed to be and it's too too brown and gray I, I i just can't get into it with no color those buildings that are all destroyed they should have flowers <laughs> pretty flowers growing out of them <laughs> yeah i i it's another one that i don't understand when people hate it like mm. obviously it's not the Terminator. It's not Terminator 2. All of us have it right in the middle of this list, and that feels about right. Like, right, yeah, it's it's a nice little extension that does something different. And unlike a bunch of these other Terminator sequels, it doesn't, like, screw with the timeline. It doesn't screw with the messaging of the franchise. It doesn't undo anything. It's just like, yeah, let's kind of tell the story in there. Yeah. Uh, now, had they gone with the original ending and <laughs> kind of fallen into that category of controversial um, mm -hmm. messing with the timeline and things like that but refresh us is, on what the original ending was supposed to be the original ending that they they wrote that got leaked on the internet the internet did what the internet does and in this case might have saved the movie the original end of the movie was john connor dies and they cut they skin him and put it on sam worthington's body 
And so the John Connor that is the guy that wins the war is actually Sam Worthington just using John Connor as this messiah symbol, uh, which that that's that is a bold choice. I don't know whether it's a good one. It doesn't doesn't serve a purpose that's interesting. Yeah, it's a shock. It doesn't. It it just like wow, that's shocking. That's crazy, but it doesn't like doesn't in any way make John Connor better. But given Marcus, this kind of journey of like this guy that was like this vicious serial killer guy, and by the end of it, he's regained a little bit of his humanity to care enough. Like, hey, go ahead and take my heart. It's a good ticker. This guy seems like a cool dude. Mm-hmm. I don't know. It works well enough. Bit cheesy, but whatever. It works. Mm-hmm. They, they had to shoehorn a, a Arnold Schwarzenegger CGI in there too. Like it didn't need that. It, I, I I didn't need him being built. Uh, the movie's fine without I think it shoehorning. Works. I, I know. I mean, it, despite I, the early CGI problems, it's yeah. It, I think with, it works with, with or without it. It I don't think it really makes that big a difference, which is mm-hmm. kind of studio thought process well we, we gotta we, we gotta have arnold uh, whether it's real or not here my kid can draw him put him in the, put that in the movie brian i love terminator salvation i think it's great uh, i think the terminator uh, the, the the trailer as you say completely uh, to know he was a terminator mm. from the trailer was just like that i mean that that literally kicks off the third and final act it's yeah. just like it's that's when we find out and yet we got that in the trailer the biggest reveal in the whole film um like that trailer paints it as if that's the setup okay first 20 minutes we've got this sam Worthington character as a terminator but he's kind of on their side possibly there's your film let's go but no, we everything about the film when you're watching it is leading up to that moment. You feel like, oh right, we're just getting through the trailer now, and then it ends. Um, but when you go to it fresh after like ten years away, and you watch it on its own terms again, once everything's died down, you're like, this is actually a really good movie. Mm. Um, too brown though. Pretty, pretty many of flowers. <laughs> it's pretty well. I've heard the together. other one too. I've heard people like, oh well, in the in the flashbacks or whatever you call them in the first two movies, it's always nighttime. Why isn't it always nighttime? Because <laughs> <laughs> they blew up the sun. <laughs> the Earth, the Earth stopped rotating. rotating. <laughs> That's awesome. Mm-hmm. I haven't heard that one, but that, that makes me smile. <laughs> We'll stick a lot of the dark fate comparisons and, and, and <laughs> criticisms with that sun criticism. All right. Uh, number 10, another one that I'm actually very happy made it this high is Prey, which is the newest one, the, kind of the reason we kicked off this 31. And again, all Woo! of us are pretty in line here. Yeah, me and Sean, correct. I think that was the first one I'm correct on. Um, this was what the Predator franchise needed. I I love the fact that it was back to basics, uh, just enough of the approach of the first one without going into like rehash territory. Um, I think that it does a really good job at telling a period piece story and giving us a narrative reason to make the whole dynamic a bit different where now it's primitive humans with arrows and rocks and clubs. And you have, the predator that um, comes down and has a different set of technology to make it slightly more fair, although he's still really advantageous. Um, I I love the fact that it's more of a hand-to-hand combat movie versus just laser shooting. Uh, I like the main character, a a bit of a cliche storyline, but I don't think it was anywhere near the, the woke travesty that the internet called it. Uh, especially the fact that she is not like a Mary Sue character. She's literally learning throughout the entire movie. She's the definition of a Mary and, Sue, Cody. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so um, I enjoyed the way that it was shot and the different wilderness that we get, the design of the new Predator. Um, there wasn't a ton about this movie that I had to complain about. Um, like I said, to the point where I really enjoy Predators and I was like, damn this is as good or just a little bit better uh, ended up giving this one the number two slot but i wish more franchises on this list would take the notes of prey like terminator go back to simple. basics mm. back downscaled medium budget and tell a simple story that's executed well enough of the massive ideas 
I think their so hand was forced here, though. They they they, they couldn't be, because the predator had failed so much. They were like, "All right, well, let's try to just make this for Hulu." So let me get this straight. In the original film, you got a bunch of highly trained marines with guns <laughs> who all get taken out, and in this one we have a young untrained woman with a bow and arrow, and she can mm. take out the predator. Mm -hmm. That if that ain't woke, I don't know what. Mm. No boy, no joy, <laughs> no white, no right. If she can't beat the predator in an arm wrestling match, I don't buy it. No, no, no. Yeah, I mean, there's it, it, there's like what three or four moments where where she's in deep shit and yeah. gets lucky. Yeah, I mean, gets saved just by like male characters, right? Just just like Arnold did, got got yeah. lucky. Hate to break it to people, but I don't know if you remember the end of Predator, but uh, that was that was a trick mm -hmm. <laughs> there wasn't fisticuffs it was a trick and when 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 they did do a boxing match uh arnold yeah arnold he's like <laughs> lifts them up like you little bitch <laughs> arnold hey arnold uh did hold up well when it was a boxing match but it, 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 even i mean the 30 minutes before she wins in this movie there's like all these other groups of people Opening yeah. fire on the predator, hitting yeah. the predator, yeah. uh, the Weakening wizard, him. brother beating yeah. the crap out of him. Like, yeah. I, I think that's the thing that was frustrating about the dialogue around this one is people that had kind of made up their mind before it came out, yeah. and that so then they the they just looked for it. And I mean, that's the yeah. internet these days. That's what they do. But you watch the movie, and it's like she's learning and growing all along. She fails at things all along, and then she's helped all along the way. That sets up the moment where. There's just enough weakness in the predator that she has learned just enough that she Takes can exploit a vulnerability. Yeah. And and she she's she's been put on her ass by with the with the bear fight. Like she she pays attention to everything they're doing. She's like, Come on guys, I, I can I can do this and she tries to do it on her own and, and, and fails. A la Rocky. That's a yeah, good no, but movie. But it's a yeah. woman, though. So yeah, and she's not white either. So yeah. that's bad. That's really bad. One thing that I would have liked to have seen, and I feel, I swear, I feel like they announced that they were going to do this, is that they were shooting the dialogue scenes two different ways: one with the Comanche language and one in in English. But all we got on Hulu was the same cut of the movie, but with dubbed which yeah, I can't yeah, stand that's... to watch. And so I, I would have preferred to see this movie if they did shoot it that way, because that was the yeah. only thing that felt odd to me was they were ta not just talking English. They were talking modern dialect. Uh, yeah. Like there's a point where the yeah. dog, they're like, yeah, your dog took a shit over here. And I'm like, is yeah. this the 1700s? They would say that. Yeah. But the brother sister stuff sounded quite modern. modern. Yeah. That, <laughs> it, which is easy to forgive, but that was the only thing mm -hmm. in the movie that stood out to me where I was like, mm, I don't know. All right. And the dog helped too. The dog Sorry. was awesome. The dog was awesome. Uh, number nine, we have Blade Runner. Uh, CP nailed that one. Bam. I win. Uh, me and Sean pretty close. You guys a little bit higher on it. Uh, all of that I will say about Blade Runner is that this is a movie that every single time that I watch it, I like. I want to like it more than I do. Like I want to yeah. see the movie that Brian, people mm -hmm. that really love this movie, see. And I strap in, I want to see it, and then every time I watch it, it just doesn't quite get there for me. I, I like the world building, the cyberpunk before it was cool thing. Uh, mm. I, I love some of the character stuff going on. There's some really interesting ideas being explored. Um, the movie's pacing hurts me sometimes whenever I watch it. Uh, I, I think that my expectations for a Harrison Ford character also hurts this movie because when you have Han Solo and Indiana Jones in a movie where he's getting his ass kicked the entire film, it's always weird for me to experience. Um, there's things that I really like and appreciate about it, and I just I, I wish I could see this sci-fi best of all time classic. And yeah. every time that I watch it, I'm like, that just kind of bored me. So yeah, I, it played at my uh, local Alamo Draft House like three weeks before we, we shot this. So I was able to actually see it on the big screen. But you and own was, the Blu-ray, Sean. I, I do. I do. And I I sold my copy of the Blu-ray to be able to buy my movie ticket. Of course, obviously. And, 
And so saw it on the big screen oh. and was hoping that maybe if I watch it in that context that I, w- I would get it more. But still, it's kind of like I, I respect it more than I enjoy it the way that other people do. And there's all sorts of things like the production design, how it's like just phenomenal some of these shots look. And they're 40 years old. Right? It's just incredible. And, and it feels like actual movie magic when you watch something like this and you really don't know how they did it. Today, it's like, yeah, they did it in computers. How did they do some of these shots? I don't. I don't really know. Models, um, models, all. But it's all the tricks combined, though. That it, you just know that it's a bunch of different stuff that make. And you see like live action with all the things, and it's you feel movie magic happening, not just mm-hmm. computers. And Post perspective. Mm-hmm. And every time I watch it, it's like, oh, for all the things I respect, at the same time, I always feel like it's kind of at arm's length. CP, Why is it amazing, you, you two? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it, it's it's in the, it's in the same ballpark as P- Prometheus, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, uh, pardon, Brian. I just think it's a great exploration of what it is to be human and the choices we make and uh, what it is that gives us our soul and just the fact that you've got this hunter hunting down these people. Uh, for you know, want of a better word, they call them replicants, but they they, they seem to be people, uh, and it's just like you, you grow to kind of you, you start out thinking these replicants are the villains, and as the film goes on, you, you grow to sympathise for them, and you grow to respect them, and respect their their desire for more life, and and you know that's that's a very human. And I think we all we all want more life. We all we all want to believe that there's something more after this life, so that you know, so that the, so that the end isn't just the end and that's it. Uh, mm-hmm. And that that's what Roy Batty's quest is for. Is it, and and just you know that speech he gives at the end. I know everybody talks about it, but it, it is this beautiful moment where it's mm-hmm. like this is this is someone who's been hunted down, who've, who's been painted as a villain. But he's actually, as it turns out, the hero of the story, who who has his pursuer in his grasp, who could choose to kill him in that moment, but actually makes the most human choice and saves his life instead, uh, and and then you know gives this speech about all the beautiful things he's seen, and and it and it, and it does make you reflect on mortality. This fact that okay, once this guy's lights are out, all these beautiful things he's seen is is, is that it? Is is that the end? It's gone, you know. And it's just like, is there a soul in there? Is 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 are those experiences just over now? And and it's just it just it just gets you to it. It just asks a lot of questions about our existence, uh, our reason for being here. What happens when we die? And it's just yeah. It and it, and it does so by transporting to transporting you to this very believable, realistic world that is not quite our own but also is at the same time and it's just as you say world building at its finest um really immersive you know to say this was 1982 go back and you and you watch this and it's just like i remember seeing this as a kid and it bored me i didn't know what was i didn't know what was happening didn't know what was going on but i still watched it just because what i was seeing on screen i was i i couldn't i couldn't compute the fact that this was as Sean says, movie magic, that, that that this was stuff technicians were doing to create these images. I didn't feel that. I felt like I was watching this other world and I couldn't explain how they'd filmed it and where this was. They'd shot this thing. And so, it did, you know, even at that age, despite the fact that it bored me back then, it did transport me to this other world that I felt compelled to watch. Um, and then as you get older and, you know, you, you question life a bit more it it, it starts to have more resonance with you and and mean more things and with each view and it has always meant something a bit more to me so yeah for me that's that's few of the reasons it's a classic and all just a few (laughs) just just a few just a few there we go moving on to number eight we have the original total recall sean again nailing the rankings I'm just going to let Sean decide for the group next time. We'll just save a lot of videos and a lot of work. 
so this is uh, this is a movie that as I get older and the more I watch it, the more I love it. Like as a kid, I always liked it, but like Terminator 2, Commando, Last Action Hero, these are movies that I watched and loved even more. As an adult, Total Recall just continues to climb my Arnie ranking to where I debated for a moment on almost putting this above the Terminator, uh, where Total Recall, I love the imagination of the concept plus the way that it's realized visually. Uh, I think that it does a really good job at balancing like the 80s ultra-violent action that you want and expect from an Arnold movie with all of these big, heavy sci-fi concepts uh, and neither one like overdoes or undercuts the other. Um, so really in- good villain work in here without having like a main bad guy that's going to go against you know arnie you guys have these different corporate figures and michael ironside and sharon stone um a, a lot of iconic moments in here like two weeks two weeks two weeks, <laughs> like stuff like that um uh it's just a movie that i have endless fun with every time that i rewatch it I'm, I'm surprised at how much i like it more it's just one of those things that ages really well for me and kind of on that point you just said about uh so many memorable moments i get it Every little scene has something that pops, that stands out. Even mm-hmm. the cab jo- driver, the Johnny Cab, you're in a Johnny Cab. The mm-hmm. the way that they get the probe out is this just <laughs> pulling the nose through the nose. Yeah. When you I mean, hear the just, crunch, you're there. Yeah, you hear the crunch. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's like the dialogue, the images, so much of it is just stands out. And then just the weird freaky guy at Quato in the guy's chest. <laughs> that, uh, it was so fun. As soon as I had children, I could call all my babies Quato for the first six months. <laughs> and that went really well at home. Um, but that's, I mean, like it takes this great Philip K. Dick exploration of how would you know if something was real or not, if you could implant um, Im- uh, uh, memories then tells this fun sci-fi action story and then has all these memorable Paul Verhoeven weird things and then just Arnold in his peak. Mm-hmm. It's just a great recipe. Agreed. My my favorite type of movie is something that is pretty decent with the action, yet you still have questions and you, you get to explore sci-fi elements of it. And it's... Uh, Paul Verhoeven movie, so the music certainly doesn't match anything that's going on on screen. (laughs) 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 Brian? Yeah, I love Total Recall. I think it's a far better film than Robocop. I think the music is very appropriately done throughout. Um, (laughs) And uh, yeah, it's just, it's just, a lot of great physical practical effects some of which don't look great now but even so i take mm. them over i think they CGI. age pretty well in like a goofy way yeah, yeah like yeah. It, it's it's appeal like, like like the the breath <laughs> like yeah, all that yeah. Yeah, it looks, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I i still prefer to watch physical effects that look a bit off than cgi Preach. that looks weightless yeah. so uh it's it's just yeah it's 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 a good good movie and I believe this is the last big gigantic blockbuster before CGI entered the picture. So this is kind of the peak of post CGI because you get one year later T2 is CGI heavy. Mm-hmm. Do you know what the first film was to have CGI in? Dragon's Lair? Westworld. The shirt. Mm. Westworld. Ooh. Wow, 70s. Interesting. All right, moving on to number 7. We've got Blade Runner 2049. This was Brian's magnum opus. Uh, <laughs> wow, I, I feel like I'm shitting on it with my number, but <laughs> I like it significantly more than I do Blade Runner. Uh, for me, you could still apply a lot of the things that I said to Blade Runner. For it, just it's it's not quite, it's not 100% my cup of tea. But I much prefer this to the original because to me, uh, outside of all of the things that they're exploring with the characters and all the things that Brian very eloquently kind of um, elaborated on with, with Blade Runner, the central premise of this one has more intrigue and mystery built into it that keeps me interested to where the first one is just a hunt movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, this one, you have this mystery that's involved with this grave and was there a baby a born from baby. a replicant? Yeah. And 
uh, you know, there's all these this intrigue built into where are we going and uh, eventually how is Harrison Ford's character going to get brought back into this and the way that they incorporate the characters and the events of the first film and uh, it, it, continuing to explore a lot of the things that they explore in the first film but now through a replicant's eyes in Ryan Gosling's character uh, and something that I had uh, talked to Brian about kind of off not off camera, but like we're, you know, talking back and forth as I was watching Blade Runner 2049 again, was I was asking him as somebody that loves the original, do you feel like a lot of the ambiguity and the fan theories and things like that, that everybody loves of the first film, does the sequel dilute any of that? And uh, by the end of the movie, I agree with Brian that it doesn't, which is pretty creative to be able to follow up a story with a finite sequel, but not delete all of the ambiguity of the first one. So still not a movie that I'm going to watch anywhere near as much as the top half or so of this list, but it works much more for me than the first one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think the first one is just um, kind of difficult to follow at times um, with the way that it's told. And I think that uh, makes somewhat makes me feel at arm's length. That's even why there are so many cuts of it. And sometimes there's voiceover, sometimes there's not. Mm -hmm. This one is a much clearer narrative. It's easier to follow. Um, and immaculate production. I mean, just looks... By far the best-looking movie on this list. Mm. Just looks incredible. So for me, this does uh, everything the first one was doing better. Yeah. Anna de Armas as a, as a hologram, too. That's, a, that's top five ranking alone. <clears throat> yeah. yeah, these movies are about sex robots. I'm telling you. <laughs> <laughs> Did you watch my 31, Brian? Did That's a no. Friendship test. I've oh not. God. I've oh not. God. Oh God. Dude, it's been. I've, I've not been able to because I went straight from working on Typecast. the Robin Hood shoot <laughs> to going away to. Uh, this home ed conference in Wales in a place where I've had zero signal for the whole week. So I still need to get, I watched the first half of CPs the night before we left and Ugh, I've literally why? Not, not been back since because <laughs> yours was the first one that was out. <laughs> there's, you're, there's some laughs to be had. I'm laughing with you and at you at the same time at multiple points in my video. So you'll enjoy okay. it whenever you do get to All it. Right. Uh, really quick, just so I don't forget these or lose them in the shuffle before uh, Brian takes it over. We have Pull Stroke saying, I've seen Seed of Chucky so many times, always awake. I fell asleep trying to finish Blade Runner. What's that say about my taste? It doesn't say anything. It, it's it, it's the way films are made now. Mm -hmm. it, it, I, it, the pacing will, will always get faster and faster. I mean, you have people that, that are in their teens now who only live on TikTok, who probably won't be able to make 60 minutes through a movie no matter how lightning fast everything is it, pacing just it it just constantly is uh yes rotating and, and changing per per generation I can blame mtv for that one Talking yeah. about Schwarzenegger classics, but criminally sleeping on The Running Man. I need to rewatch it. I haven't seen it in years, but I never liked it as a kid. That was the only Arnold movie I watched. Where the, I was like, I'm good. Is that the one um, where he's like on a TV show yes. or something? I yeah. haven't Headed seen it. Uh, it's one liners every five seconds, from what I remember. You Christmas tree, come here. And I'm like, okay. Based <laughs> off a <laughs> writing from Richard Bachman. Hmm. Uh, there you go. It's um, Stephen King. Um, Yes. <laughs> Brian, take us away. Number one. Uh, it's, uh, man. It's, uh, I, I've, I, I watched Blade Runner 2049 and it feels as close to a religious experience as you can get when watching a film. It just, I, everything about it is pure magic. Cinematography, performances, mm -hmm. that it, it does... It's one of those sequels, the reason it's such a phenomenal sequel is because it doesn't just take what the first one did and redo it, but slightly different. Um, every single thing in there hinges on the first film, but also feeds back to it. So when you go back and you watch the first film, the sequel has literally enriched 
the 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 the, the first film uh and so it's just this is this thing where it's just they're both now feeding off each other and feeding into each other and it's just it feels so organically it, it just it feels like it was made by the same director almost around the same time as the first one was made by all the same people it's just it's so brilliant as a sequel in that regard to say that it came 30 years after the fact um like no one no one thought it was a good idea to do a Blade Runner sequel that far after the original. It was bonkers. But to, <laughs> na to nail it the way Villeneuve did... Is, the people is that just... put the money up for the movie would probably still agree. <laughs> uh, well, well, they're wrong. It was a great decision. It's one of the best movies ever made. It's in my top ten movies ever made. It's just... the I think Ryan Gosling's incredible in it. Uh, I think his... That, that moment when he goes to see the woman who builds the dreams and he realizes he's not the one. Uh, and, and that's what we get in movies all the time. Every story we get in, in big Hollywood movies is about the one, the chosen one, the one who's going to lead the resistance. And it turns out he's not. He's just, he's, he's totally arbitrary. He's just, hmm. he's just a rep. He's just, a, he's just another rep. Some dude. Um, but the point, but the point is, he makes the choice again, harkening back to the original with Ro what Roy Batty does. He makes the choice to save a life, and that's what makes him human. You know, it's it's just like the, the whole, the whole spiel that the company gives is, you know, with with replicants is more human than human, and it uh, and it's like, and that that's kind of the theme that plays throughout. And that song is used in the trailer for Soldier, which is in the Blade Runner universe. <laughs> On your bike. <laughs> Paul Anderson can suck it. Um, <laughs> there's no way I'm ever putting that film in the same universe as this. But, it's, but it is. It's this, this notion of more human than human. Uh, it, it's it's, it's this, this, this guy who... Has a, he has a religious experience in, in a way himself, you know, and you've got this character played by Dave Batista who who's, who's, who's the instigator of that notion that there is something more, there is something spiritual at work here. For all of these pieces to have come into play, there must be something guiding the pieces, there must be something spiritual, and that's a notion that kind of gets lodged into Kay's mind where it starts to feed into this idea that maybe he's the one, maybe he, he's, he's, he's built for some grander purpose, that God, that this, whatever you want to call it, God, a higher power is directing him in some way. And he learns that, okay, that, that might not be the case, but he can still make a choice. He can still make a choice to do something that matters and he chooses to, to save a life. And, and, and it's, just, it's just, yeah, really beautiful, poignant, uh, incredible to look at. The music is is fantastic. The, it's just production design, everything. Every it's just absolutely brilliant. And and the character of Deckard in this, even though he doesn't come in it until the final third, because the film builds so well on the original, it just everything with that character just has depth to it and warmth and humanity and. I love it. It's it's a fantastic movie. One of the best movies ever made, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, further proof that the Academy doesn't know what the hell they're doing, because this is the first movie that Roger Jenkins finally wins an Oscar for cinematography. And if you look at his history, you're like, <laughs> first? Okay. They have a history of, of doing that, of like compiling losses for somebody, and then they just kind of like, all right, fine, yeah. here you go. They did the same thing with Scorsese. They're like, okay, they yeah. departed, here you go. And it's like, yeah, but, 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 but he deserved it on this. Oh, no, 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 uh, no. Was, oh, yeah, no, yeah, right. Yeah, this, like, it's not exactly like Scorsese, because most people say, oh, Depart is a very good film, but is this the one that he should have got it for? Did he? He it? did 1917 too, right? Did he? No. Roger Deakins? No, oh no, yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah, Roger Deakins, so, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So he yeah, has he two did. now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, <laughs> They're really trying to make up. Yeah. He also did Shawshank <laughs> Redemption and Dan mm. Walking and 
Fargo. Oh man, Fargo. Assassination of Jesse James, which personally yeah. I thought should have won. Uh, and it should have been nominated for Best Picture as well. It's just, yeah, the dude's my favourite cinematographer, and he just yeah nails it. Quick super chat. Thirty-one on thirty-one idea. Marvel, X-Men, Toby and Andrew, Spider-Man, Blade, Punisher, Fantastic Four, Ghost Rider, Venom. Thanks for the wonderful stream, guys. Uh, all I'll say is that we have plenty of ideas in the oven. Hmm. But thank you for the enthusiasm of coming up with an idea. I appreciate it. Um, Matrix number six. Uh, this is this is almost a, a Brian Robocop thing. <laughs> Four, three, five, thirteen. Uh, so this is all I need to say about the Matrix. There are very few movies in my lifetime that I can think of that have had an impact that you can just feel on the level of the matrix like cinema was one way and then the matrix happened and then action cinema specifically was like forever changed because yeah. of one movie and there's very few movies that i can think of that i was there to see i was there to see it in theaters and i was there to see the influences and everything that came afterwards on the level of the matrix uh, one of the best sci-fi action movies and for all of my issues that i explained earlier with the other three movies this is the only movie that, to me, just got it all right. Balanced the, phil the philosophical storyline and the lore with the action, and you have gunplay with, like, kung fu influences and uh, a lot of mind-bending sci-fi stuff. So I, I think Matrix is awesome, and that's all I need to say about it. I Ryan. actually wasn't crazy oh, about yeah. it when it first came out. Um, I mean, I liked it, but almost I had... How old were you when you saw it? Uh, seventeen. What was it? Ninety-seven. Nine. Ninety-nine. Okay, 99. yeah, I was. I was nine. Okay. Um, and so I, I went in and um, I had like just the right amount of information and lack of maturity and perspective that I was like, "What? This is like a bunch of other stuff. It's kind of like the plot of Terminator, but it's got the gunfights from John Woo. It's got the martial arts from these Jet Li movies. And I saw Akira kind of had a little bit of a flavor to that in parts of it." And I didn't understand, like, right, that's what makes it so brilliant. It's it's kind of the same reason that makes so much of Tarantino stuff brilliant. It's pulled from so many things very overtly, but he does something so fresh and new with it. And that's what this did with all these different action genres, all these different sci-fi genres, as well as philosophically, theologically, intertwines them together seamlessly and used cutting-edge visual effects that were just kind of mind-blowing when we first saw it that would fit perfectly into the mythology, into the story. So it just merged everything together perfectly. And so it was like a year or two after it came out, I was like, no, wait, that's like the greatest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> Brian? Yeah, it's, it's, it's just the first thing I saw about it, you got to bear in mind that this, this, when this came out, pretty much Keanu Reeves career taking a nosedive johnny mnemonic and, and all that it was just it's like, amazing yeah. how many times his career deep. has done that where he kind of <laughs> yes, disappears and yes. then just skyrockets back yeah. into the stardom he's the comeback king um so i open my issue of empire magazine and i see this five star review for a sci-fi movie starring keanu reeves called the matrix and i'm like what the hell is this are they are they smoking crack or something um so I go to see it with my brother, who also is like, why are you dragging me to see this Keanu Reeves movie? It's like, I was like no, no, it's, it's got a five-star review in Empire. It's like, well, then they must be smoking crack or something. So we both go, we watch it, and we're just like, <clears throat> totally blown away. And I saw it three times in the cinema. And this is the year the hype was all major for star wars because phantom menace was on its way <laughs> and um, it was not the movie that we remember <laughs> no, 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 no. No. but it's just like i went to see matrix three times at the cinema i can tell you i didn't see phantom menace three times at the cinema um but i, I it's just it's just one of those films that crept in under the radar there was never any talk about the making of it beforehand like literally the first thing i knew of it was that five-star review i read in empire and you know, i read empire a lot back then so there was, there was never any articles about the upcoming film called the matrix is it something to get excited about oh i don't know because i never flipping heard of it it was just one minute it wasn't there 
and then it was just there and everybody was talking about it and everybody was going back to see it um so it, it was unless you were there when it came out it, it's it's like any phenomenon in it is when something just totally blows up yeah. even less so today i think because i think phenomenons last for less time these days oh yeah because there seems to be one out every week whereas back then you had the majority of movies that were out which is yeah it's the average movie word of mouth week. had a lot of yeah. strength well yeah. you felt the post matrix action era for like seven yeah. years after this Big movie time, came out yeah, yeah. one so, thing that's funny too uh, i'll always remember the matrix because it was the first dvd that we ever bought when my dad finally bought a DVD player, this was the first one. I just remember us being fucking movie nerds, and we're just so blown up. There's theatrical trailers. Look, look, watch this. When he's going slow motion, you can go frame by frame. Yeah. This is awesome. When, now that we when, do you, it, when you pause fast. it, the picture doesn't go. Yeah. That was so funny. Like, like stuff that if you tried to explain it to my kids, they would be like, you're an yeah. idiot. But like, back then, you watch it, and you're like, let's watch all of the special features because they're there. <laughs> and just so many things that when we got DVD, it was just, you can't put into words, just like The Matrix, unless you were there when that hit, you can't put the jump between VHS and DVD into perspective. Mm -hmm. Well, they, they put out the thing, The Matrix Revisited, that was like a feature length behind yeah. the scenes documentary. Mm -hmm. And it was like walking you through how they made this movie. And you're like, oh, wow. And they trained for three months on the wires. And you're like, the special features were this exciting thing that people were talking about. Mm -hmm. And yeah. you just didn't have things like that. You'd only have like the promo thing that they'd put on ABC or something like that that was 20 minutes long. It's just the puff piece. It's like, wow, this is how movies are made. <laughs> mm -hmm. So CP, why does it suck? Yeah, no, I, it, I, I recognize that it's brilliant. I mean, I, I, it's, a, it's a terrifically made movie. Uh, uh, I just, I just, there's just some movies that I just, I, I, yeah, I, I don't have the key. And uh, yeah, I, I watched it and... Uh, Everybody around me was like, oh, "The Matrix, The Matrix," and I was just like, "Yeah, I, yeah it was good." Friday um, Thirteenth, bloody hell! <laughs> hey, we all have those critter boy. Yeah. Oh, man. All right, uh, we'll try to wrap up these next five because I don't imagine we're going to have very different things to say. Uh, number five is Predator. Um, I had it the highest. Wow, I'm surprised by that. Okay, so we have Predator here. One thing, I think Sean always says this too, is one of our mind meld moments. One thing that it's always stands out to me about Predator is I never remember it as an Arnold Schwarzenegger action movie. I always remember it as a Predator movie. Uh, it's the only movie that Arnold's like larger than life on screen personality isn't like the star of the show. I think he's like just cast as a character in this sci fi action thing. The Predator is my favorite creature design of all time, which is a tall order or a, a really big thing to say when you have things like the Xenomorph. Um, what's so funny? So it's just, there's a few times this Richie Work has mentioned Blippy in the comments section. I've, I've only just twigged what he's talking about. But it's oh. Funny. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as you said it, it connected with me immediately. Anyway, uh, so... <laughs> oh, there we go. Uh, so, yeah, there's not much else I could say. It's one of the, my favorite movies of all time. Uh, it's a great action movie. It's a great sci-fi movie. It's a great horror movie. One of those movies that blends genres perfectly. Um, uh, I love it. Love it to death. Blippy, any thoughts on the subject? <laughs> <laughs> we'll fill you in afterwards. Charles, <laughs> thoughts on Predator? Um, perfect, perfect representation of an R-rated '80s action movie. Uh, I, I, another, uh, another exaggeration of. I mean, right down to the shot of you, son of a bitch, with the zoom in on the on the forearms when they're when they're shaking hands. You know, uh, just just the exaggeration of of army culture if you will and um uh, the the effects for the time <laughs> <coughs> do you get the joke now is that, okay. I, I don't know who Blippi is somebody's, uh, that somebody's guy. <laughs> 
He, we don't need to go into who Blippy is. He's just a YouTube guy for kids. But somebody's making a joke. That you, you and Blippy's apparel are sharing some similarities. So that's I. I know. I normally get Uncle Junior from The Sopranos, but hey, there yeah. you are. Mm. <coughs> Sean, My shit's Predator. always gonna match. What do you want me to say? Uh, I mean, it's just a perfect little. Well, I guess it may, if you would even use the same language, perfect little representation of a, a 80s sci-fi action movie, except I well take, said. I, well said. Take take out the representation part. It's just a perfect sci-fi 80s action movie. Just tense, mm. exciting from beginning to end, memorable, and the thing that me and you, Cody, say all the time when I'm talking about it, it's like the Arnold movie that doesn't feel like an Arnold movie while being an Arnold classic. Yeah. And so they just, take all of the biggest, most macho, glistening muscle dudes of the '80s and make them bitches <laughs> compared to the, the monsters they're against. Basically, all right. Moving on to number four, which is Alien. This was Charles' number one. The rest of us pretty close there. Seven, six, eight. Um, this is a film. Uh, two kinds of people on Earth: alien or aliens. I'm an aliens guy, so I, I really enjoy this movie. Respect the hell out of it. Uh, love the slasher movie in space. Um, but I always pick Aliens before I pick this one. So not that I need to justify why it's at, what did I have it at, like six? Yeah, not that I, eight. Not eight. that I need to justify why it's in the top eight of a stacked movie list like this. But uh, yeah, there you go. I'm an Aliens guy. CP. Yeah, yeah. Uh, prototypical slasher. Uh, uh, it, it, it's it's the no perfect slasher. It doesn't have a knife. He's not cutting people up with a knife. He's not a slasher. Shut <laughs> up. You don't know the rules of slashers. We'll revisit that here in a moment. Blipping. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's 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 in, incredible. Uh, and Sigourney Weaver's uh, uh, Mary Sue. Uh, just for the record. <laughs> no, it's uh, I. I I've I've done three or four rankings, and Alien is always if if it's the Alien franchise, my favorite has always been Alien because it 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 captures. I, I'm a Star Wars fan. It, it captures the the silly sci-fi things of Star Wars and the silly <laughs> like Star things. Star Wars, but people get fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wish I wish it were like that. <laughs> Brian. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a great slasher movie in space, isn't it? <laughs> it's, it's, but it's just, it's so much more than that as well. It's just, it, it, it is a film that also is about ideas. I, I get a lot from the character of Ash and his complete lack of feeling uh, when it comes to experimentation and just like, he, he's, he's like a curious I relate to him child. a great bit. Yeah, yeah, me too. Just no, it's just he's like this curious child um, that doesn't really see humans as things with souls, but rather something to just yeah. It's it's yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on. And, and if you want to um, feel like garbage, uh, Google sexual subtext and alien, and, and you'll see it a no, completely different way. I've seen this. a I'm documentary on that, and uh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> my life. Oh, um, <laughs> magazine. I think, mm. well, I think it's a movie that, on a plot level, it's very simple and straightforward, but it's executed so well that everything is has more to it than it seems at face value. Mm -hmm. Just the inner workings of the crew, uh, the adding of the Ash character and what he represents, the corporation, mm -hmm. like everything, just feels fleshed out, developed. Much like Blade Runner, it's incredible that this movie came out over forty years ago. Some of these shots, you're like. How that looks so good for being over 40 years old. It just looks so good. Except the alien suit. When he does this, there's that, that thing when he's in the hall and he goes like this. <laughs> there's, there's, there's nothing that, as, and there's nothing in the dialogue for Ripley that suggests she's a woman. You could literally cast a male actor in that role and it wouldn't make oh, don't a say difference that. to the, uh, to the, 
the kind of the so then what's the point of making her a woman yeah. i mean yeah. just, uh, i mean <laughs> and he would look way better in panties yeah, at the yeah. end too that's that that's way the better. point though that is the point <laughs> i agree but, but, it's, <laughs> but that was that was ridley scott's decision to 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 cast a woman in that role and it 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 does something it does something um and final it's, it's, girl yeah it's just uh yeah but it's not it's not <laughs> Speaking of not a slasher, number three is the original Terminator, uh, five five four seven. I don't know how that averaged out to three. Must have been some that tied there at the end. Uh, anyway, the Terminator. Um, That's what I love about averages like that. It's so weird because yeah, you get yeah. those three or four that tie, and you're like, well, shit. Well, there was another just... one at the end that was really low, but none of us had it ranked that low. <laughs> yeah. uh -huh. Averages are crazy. It's because yeah. you have those outliers of ones yeah. and then the sevens yeah. that throw everything crazy. Yeah, but I'm fine with this one taking the third slot. Uh, so, yeah, I, I've gotten a lot of flack, even, even more so than the argument against Alien. I've gotten a lot of flack for saying that the Terminator is basically a slasher. Uh, <laughs> I'll die on the hill that it's a slasher. I won't even have any argument whatsoever that it's a horror film. Uh, the action is there. But more so than any of the other sequels, there's a very horror tone to this one. Uh, if, if Arnold Schwarzenegger was carrying around a machete, nobody would have that argument whatsoever. But nonetheless, uh, impaling people with your arms and pulling their guts out and shooting people doesn't amount to a slasher, I guess. Nonetheless, we'll table that. Uh, incredible original movie for this franchise especially being that it's a very low budget film uh, some of the stop motion effects don't age so well that's really where my negatives start and finish with this film and that's even a minute negative i think that it's a, a brilliant story uh, i love the way that they have that whole time paradox thing regarding the protector that's sent back that ends up being the father of the savior and all of that uh, arnold schwarzenegger there's a reason why this movie kind of skyrocketed his career because for somebody that you could argue as more of a wooden actor, especially early on. This is a role that perfectly fit into his skill set at the time and just made him instantly iconic. You have and yet, um, and yet, and yet, he does make choices with regards yep. to his performance that are very calculated that yeah. other actors maybe wouldn't have done. Yeah, um, he he talks about it um, in, in a video where he was. I think he was. I don't know where timeline it is as far as the franchise but whenever he was talking to james cameron about if they do one without him he's like make sure whoever you cast is like a machine like they can't look at a gun when they're reloading it they can't do it when they're pulling they can't when they go to grab something they just know where it is and when you know that and you watch the movies and see it you're like oh yeah that was a deliberate choice he ain't looking at nothing he just knows he must have been is. hanging around with peter weller <laughs> when they when they interviewed your notes <laughs> when they interview or james cameron interviewed um him uh, James Cameron didn't want to hire him, but it was for Kyle Reese is what he's being interviewed for. And then they showed up wow. at a meeting and Arnold wouldn't stop talking about uh, and it was just like, uh, OK, I'll meet with this guy. I'm obviously not going to cast a bodybuilder to play Kyle Reese. And they meet up and he just kept talking about the Terminator. And and, and like, wait a minute, I think I need to cast this guy. <laughs> Yeah. This guy is the Terminator, but it wasn't really intentional. It just kind of came about mm -hmm. because that's the one that Arnold was thinking about what it needed to be. And um the rest is history, but yeah, just a, a great concept executed really well um, in its own way. Kind of like the matrix it's matrix. It's this merging of a bunch of different genres seamlessly where that's where the purists are like, well, it's not a horror movie. Uh, you obviously know what we're talking about though. You obviously know why we're saying it's like a horror movie. Clearly it's sci-fi. It's clearly it's action, but it just merges them together in a way that is very satisfying with having just a great mythology that you you want to tell more stories in this world because it's just so much so rich of everything that that's there i i think the only reason people have such a hard on for not calling it a horror movie is because horror is looked down upon as, yep. as a subgenre but it like cody said if you put a machete in his hand it's a slasher it, it, it's 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 the the same shit. He's running around chasing after people, and they even give him a slashing in the phone book killer. Like they even give him a serial killer name. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Arthur Mitchell inspiration there. Yeah. Lance Henriksen was originally meant to play the Terminator actually before. Uh, 
That would have been a very different movie. Hmm. Oh, big time. That's uh, but yeah, I, I I love it. Absolutely love it. Um, from like the age of eight till like the age of eleven, I, that I that was just my favorite film. Uh, me and my brother <laughs> just watched it constantly, all the time. Um, the T eight hundred. As as an as an eight year old, watching the T eight hundred, that was just like, oh, man. It's unlike anything I'd ever seen, it was just, and it was just—that's a horror image. I mean, I mean, the, the the whole film was born from a a nightmare that Cameron had of that creature rising out of the fire, of the of the, the machine rising out of the fire. Hmm. Um, with and it's just like, yeah, he 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 designed it to be a horror movie. That's 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 what it is. But um, but it is that's also what a they need to get movie, back to action movie. Yeah, I agree. Uh, so, yeah, I, I love it. Uh, it's, it's an absolute classic. Um, it's just it's so much of what Carl Reese says. Everything that Carl Reese says is just exposition, and yet it never feels like exposition because yep. it's just constantly moving and moving and moving. It's just one long chase sequence, and it's right. It's, it's you know that it's, it's so much exposition in a car chase. Yeah, <laughs> like they're driving faster to get away, so you get you're able to get away with like now. Lead character one is going to tell lead character two everything, but you're in a car chase, so you don't even care, and it's answering questions that you were you were wondering as the audience. Yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. All right, moving on to number two here, and we have aliens. So we got two, two, three, three. So me and Sean were correct, obviously. Brian, and, <laughs> Brian and Charles hated it. I don't know why, but. <laughs> Sean, I didn't put point four. <laughs> there you go. Sean, I'm going <laughs> to let you lead this one. Yeah, I mean, I just think it takes everything that I loved about Alien, and it just kind of adds more layers to it. I'm more of an action person, so then the fact that it is more of an action film, it's going to work better for me. I like James Cameron more than I like uh, Ridley Scott. And so, uh, I mean, just kind of everything about it, it's taking something I already loved and just adding more to it. There's more emotion. There's kind of more character, more action, a little bit faster paced, and um, just uh, um, giving you really something to root for as the movie goes along, as Ripley is trying to save this little girl that just makes for such a satisfying conclusion to the film. It keeps you on the edge of your seat basically from the beginning with the sense of tension that never lets up until the credits roll. And so, I mean, just a phenomenal sequel to an already fantastic film. Absolutely. Brian? Yeah, I mean, the, my top three, so a- Aliens was my number three. It's it's my number 11 in, in my in my favourite movies of all time. Uh, so that right there just tells you how stacked this list is. Uh, my top four on this list are in my top 20 movies of all time so me too it, it's just yeah and it's yeah. actually misleading because i don't include i only include one movie from a franchise and so right. then like alien and the terminator aren't in my top 20 but they yeah. probably are in my top 20 yeah yeah so it's it's just that that's that's what we're dealing with, uh, you know. And three three of those movies are james cameron so mm-hmm. <laughs> um yeah Aliens, it's it's just it's incredible. Uh, just the, the way it makes you feel for those characters, um, and the commentary on motherhood, uh, not just through the character of Ripley, but through the the alien itself. Um, the ba- the fact that by the end of the film, both of these are just protective mothers going up against each other. It's just it's fantastic. It's just like Cameron just nails everything in it. The action's spot on. The tension's just constant. Um, the 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 characters that should be really quite throwaway, like Hicks uh, and that that really manly woman who's like proper. It, it's just like that's the the, the step or the adopted mom. Yeah, in yeah from mom Terminator, in Terminator yeah, Two. Terminator, yeah, <laughs> it's just like th- their Asking character. Casting in the eighties. Yeah, it's like they're characters that in all the movies that have aped aliens since just become cannon fodder. You're just like, oh, yeah, they've got certain lines of dialogue because they've got to get them to say something, but you don't really care about them. Whereas in this, they feel like really pe- real people. They feel like a, a proper team. Mm-hmm. Uh, you buy the camaraderie, their camaraderie. The, yeah, the, it's just, all that. 
just just nailed. I, I, I don't think Cameron gets enough credit as a writer a lot of the time. Um, but when he ex when he explores things like thematically, he does it in such a great way. The way that he writes his scenes and gets everything to play into a specific theme. And I just think everybody cre credits him as yeah, develops new technology and makes spectacle. But actually, he he's very concerned with character as well. I mean, I think he could... spends so long out of the public consciousness. <laughs> like he has true yeah. eyes, and then he takes like years, and then he makes Avatar, and then he goes away for two decades, and then comes. You got Titanic that, in the middle there. Uh, yeah, yeah. That little <laughs> film. Uh, <laughs> it, it didn't make much of a splash. Uh, but I mean, I, I, I mean uh, legitimately, let me think. Sank at I mean, the box think... office. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, you take Avatar out of the mix. Um, it, it, and all of a sudden you look at the movies he wrote in Terminator, uh, Aliens, Terminator 2, and you get, he plays a lot different, but when the one that is on our minds and most recent is Avatar and it's Pocahontas, it's Dancing with Wolves. Don't start. Don't Man start, Brian. <laughs> we'll get there when we get the new sequel. Last we'll we'll reconvene in December. Fern Gully. <laughs> Fern Gully. <laughs> Uh, CP, yeah, yeah, everything Brian said, and uh, it, it just, just you know, I they do a better job. I, I referenced how Predator kind of mocks the USA military uh, trope, and they do a much better job of it in Aliens, where uh, Ripley's like, "Motherfucker, I've seen this thing. You guys don't know what you're getting into," and they're all like, "Fuck it, it doesn't matter." <laughs> 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 Look at this gun. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, no. It, uh, it's, it's. I mean, it's like everybody said. We're the, the top five, or you know, they're they're in our our treasure chest of movies you must have. Yes. So uh, you really can't go wrong from here out. Mm -hmm. And I have absolutely nothing to add because you guys all said my thoughts. Aliens, right. is the shit. Um, number one, and me and Uncle Sean were correct with number one. Yes. Yet again, Brian and CP just being haters. I don't understand. But no, uh, Terminator <laughs> 2, Judgment Day. Uh, this is the one movie that constantly makes me question whether or not Die Hard actually is my favorite film of all time. Because every time I watch T2, I'm just like, ooh, but that one. Uh, this is one of those VHS tapes as a kid that I'm surprised didn't just bust off of the spools as many times Thanks, as I rewatched it. Uh, it. It's a perfect movie. One of the few movies out there that I would say are just perfect. Can't add or change anything. I do like the director's cut as far as adding things, but James Cameron has amazing director's cuts. But even the theatrical cut, it's just like there's nothing missing here. There's nothing. Yeah, the theatrical cut's the best cut for me. Uh, it's, it's the definitive cut for me. Yeah, so the, the way that he takes, just like with Aliens, the, the concept of the first movie and just builds on it with changing up the theme a little bit and expanding on some of the things that were explored in the first one. Now you have the, the different subversion to where the, the threat of the first film is now the protector of the second film. Uh, the way that they increase Sarah Connor and explore her character in a very different way and just the performances and the way that uh, Linda Hamilton bulked up for that role. She's still what I would say is my favorite final girl even though that makes the the slasher gatekeepers ass itch when i say that i think it's uh, the action gatekeepers more than there the you slasher go gatekeepers. probably fair enough uh as far as action the movie's like unprecedented where it's just like action sequence after action sequence i mean you've got the bar fight you've got the motorcycle chase you've got the mm -hmm. the asylum breakouts then you have uh the whole thing at cyberdyne and then you have the steel mill i mean it's just like goes from one like genre defining sequence to another the way that they have the t-1000 as a concept and the way that it's visualized with cg still looks immaculate to this day um because it's so simple mm. and it, i'm gonna leave room for everybody else to say some things but yeah this is just one of those movies where anything that i want to talk about i'm just like that's that's 10 out of 10 perfect execution with that one brian yeah, I mean, uh, <clears throat> again, I think uh, Cameron's continuing that theme of motherhood, 
but he's also dealing a lot with the theme of fatherhood as well uh, and you look at <clears throat> John's been raised by a lot of absent fathers fathers who've cocked it up and just they're just not they're not right for what he needs and it turns out that actually the T800 <laughs> is the perfect father figure for him by the time he gets to the end of the film and it's just like um, again it calls into question the nature of <clears throat> humanity and machines and you know what, what does have it just sin I guess you know like the the, the we have a soul but that also means we have the potential to make choices that are corruptive to that soul destructive to to our very being and yet machines can can as it turns out be the perfect father figures precisely because they don't have a soul uh because well that's know, why i'm having technology in particular video games raise my son <laughs> <laughs> because <laughs> it's 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 a film about fate versus free will you know it's like we we have free will but we can choose to use that free will to destroy ourselves um and then you have this machine that doesn't have free will it's programmed to do what he does which is to protect protect john connor so you know if if we were programmed in that same way yeah we the, the 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 earth would probably have no wars or no no famine no but we wouldn't have free will so we we need we need that ability to destroy ourselves in order to also have the ability to love and 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 do things that are, are quite admirable uh so it, it yeah it's it's a great film about all that stuff that you don't even have to acknowledge if you don't want to because you can come to it just purely mm -hmm. on terms of i want to see stuff blow up mm -hmm. And it does that on the next level. So In space. It, yeah. And I, I mean, that's when I think you have a movie that kind of does it right, where you can just watch it and turn your brain off mm -hmm. and it works. But if you keep your brain turned on, there's all these sorts of things. If you just stop and think of it, oh, that's a really interesting idea. Oh, that's, mm -hmm. well, that's actually kind of poignant. Like, that's like, wow, okay, that's really cool. While also having cutting edge special effects, amazing stunt work, and, um, I don't know, just it pulls it all together. And at the same time, it ruined the franchise because it made them think every Terminator <laughs> movie in the future has to be a big blockbuster. And they mm -hmm. forgot it started as small budget, clever ideas, horror, action, sci-fi. Phone sci books. Kind. <laughs> if only we had more phone books in Genesis, it would have been awesome. <laughs> Charles. I like it. I I say uh, yeah I mean I, to tri triple it everything everybody says uh, I, I I love me some good action and my favorite part is the the scene because because John's telling him not not to hurt anybody and they're all they're all at the Cyberdyne headquarters mm -hmm. and he's just got this chain gun and he's shooting all the cops and the helicopter and every like he's just destroyed the entire parking lot and uh, casualties, none. <laughs> like it's, it, it, it has a lot of live. jokes in it, but they're, yeah. not, they're not like silly put glasses on yeah. gags. It's yeah. like, promise you won't kill anyone. Shoots yeah. the guy in the knee. He'll live. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So exactly. Funny, but it, it plays literal. It's like, it secondary. Literal. But, but, yeah. but, the th but, but the thing is, it's, it's uh, again, this, this is when Cameron doesn't get enough credit as a writer. That gag is feeding into the themes I was just talking mm -hmm. about, about fate versus free will. If he's programmed not to hurt someone, he won't hurt someone. It's out of his control because that's just what has been programmed. If John Connor says, do not kill anyone, he won't kill anyone. He's had his, he's no free will. So that, that right there, that gag is feeding into the theme. Whereas sticking a pair of Elton John sunglasses on, has got nothing to do with any theme that is being explored in Terminator 3. It's just... I think that's the cover of the red eyes, but I understand your point, Brian. Fuck you, asshole. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Me too. <laughs> yeah, so, we all agree, greatest movie ever made. Yeah, <clears throat> greatest right. sci-fi action, by sure. It, for me, you asked me on the right day of the week, I might be like, I'm so sorry, Bruce Willis, but... That ain't a sci-fi. Uh, I'm telling you. <laughs> it doesn't matter. I'm talking about best movie ever made. So yeah, T2, I mean, that's just... 
that's peak cinema as far as I'm concerned. If you want to know what type of movie to make for me, T2. Just follow that and do it. And Another it. example of timing with movies where people won't appreciate what <clears throat> Terminator 1 to Terminator 2 was. Like the fact that he was the villain in Terminator 1. It, people just automatically think that Arnold Schwarzenegger is the good guy. Mm -hmm. And that that moment in the, in the in the mental facility is such a big deal where where Linda Hamilton's character, she, like she freaks out when she when she first comes across him. That won't hit the same way to people now who already know so much like it's just like the I am your father from from Empire. Like there's just it's just one of those things where like you had to be there otherwise it won't have the same punch yeah i wish i could have watched this movie uh just to, for, had the experience of watching this and going in blind i know mm. they they told you it in the marketing so everybody that walked into this knew that he was the good guy now at that point in his career you couldn't make arnold the, the bad guy but um he he the scene where they're at the mall and it's him and robert patrick going at each other and robert <laughs> patrick is framed very much like uh, kyle reese and then mm -hmm. all of a sudden, come with me if you want to live. I'd be like, whoa, he's yeah. the good guy this one? Like, I, just, I wish I could have that experience. But yeah, yeah, I'm with you. Um, anything else to say about T2? It's a classic for good reason. Oh, yeah. There you Flawless. go. Flawless. Flawless. I, I, I can't think of any flaws to it, to be perfectly honest. How was the music, though? <laughs> Incredible. Yes. Incredible. <laughs> Perfectly suited every scene. Well, too much Guns N' Roses for my taste, but, you know, whatever. That's one of the Guns N' Roses songs that I actually like because I don't hear it every 15 fucking minutes when I walk out <laughs> my house. Um, yeah, guys, so that is it. That is the 31 on 31 Monsters and Machines debrief. If you watch this without seeing our videos, the video description down below, they're all about an hour long, so... You have some some time to pop some popcorn, but go watch our individual lists and see our more in-depth reasoning for all of them. Subscribe to all these guys' channels. Uh, we'll go around the horn really quick. Sean, what do we have coming up on Sean Chandler Talks About to look forward to? Uh, this next week, I got a bunch of Cobra Kai content coming out because of the new season, so I want to talk about it from every single angle, and I think Cody, me and you are probably going to do a live stream talking spoilers on that one sometime this week. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the big thing uh, until the next to last week of the month or some towards the end of the month. Cody, you're coming to stay at my house. We're going to go to a film festival together. If you didn't yeah. know that, Cody, now you Somewhere. know. Oh. So, I was yeah. wondering why my bags were packed. But <laughs> yeah, so, it's going to be interesting. I'm already getting flight jitters because I don't travel very often. So I'm like checking <laughs> bag policies and I'm like, Sean, you fly more. Don't often bring luggage. Like, Oh, I know. I'm not bringing. I'm not checking anything. I'm not, I'm not coming to England. England. <laughs> yeah, Certainly so not. Not hard drives or anything. Please don't. Yeah. So uh, yeah. So that's coming up. Uh, Brian, what can we look forward to on Brian Lomax? So I've got a top ten of 1995 coming up. Just every now and again, I just like to pick a random year and see what my top ten is for that year. So yeah, 1995. Top 10 coming up. Charles. Uh, I, I have a, a couple of things. I actually have a, a themed video about poker that I can't really talk about because um, it, I have a partnership for that. Um, other than that, I might actually be doing modern reviews for both Pearl and uh, Don't Worry Darling mm. uh, in the next 10 days or so. Very cool. Uh, well, for those that have been following my channel, I just kicked off a John Carpenter review series last week. And so we've got uh, The Fog coming up next. Uh, as far as this weekend, tomorrow I'll have my Cobra Kai ranking. And Monday I will have my, uh, or excuse me, tomorrow I'll have my Sleepaway Camp ranking. Monday I will have my Cobra Kai ranking. Then The Fog. Then me and Sean will do a live stream, hopefully uh, at some point in the middle of the week for Cobra Kai Season 5. Um, Pearl comes out oh. Friday, and I'm gonna try to squeeze Escape from New York this week as well. So I'm pretty much just focusing on John Carpenter flicks in between the new releases, of which we have Pearl and Jeepers Creepers until I will be a temporary Texan. 
I, I forgot to mention on Wednesday the 14th, there's, we're doing a live stream about representation in horror. And is there an LGBTQ plus uh, agenda in horror? And uh, I have a bunch of guests, Sweet and Spooky, Desmond's Flicks, and Dice Roland to talk about just just uh, a whole bunch of things. And just how, how woke is they them amongst other things? There we go. Uh, when is the horror tier list? Uh, so what are we on? The sixth one? That'll be probably sometime next month, if not... Um, shit, maybe even November, because October is just slammed, guys. Like, when it comes to horror films, mm. like, between sep the end September and October, it's kind of shocking how many major things we have coming. I mean, we've got Jeepers Creepers, you got Pearl, you've got... Um, calm down, Brian. Ter Terrifier 2. Uh, you have Chucky season two and of course Halloween ends, which is going to be like a week's worth of content easy. So, um, yeah, we may be on a little bit of a pause on the tier lists, but I will be going back to that uh, very soon. But yeah, the next month or so is balls to the wall on this channel. Uh, all right. So that is it, guys. Thank you so much for joining us. For those that maybe watched for the full three hours and 20 minutes, I knew <laughs> there was no chance in hell we were going to get through this one quickly. Two hours. Two hours. <laughs> 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 uh, as always, thank you guys for watching. Thank you for the super chats. Thank you for the support. Uh, be sure to like and share this video. Hit the subscribe button on the way out if you're watching this in the future. <laughs> and with that being said, good night, everyone.